Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joseph Attic, Executive Chairman of ID for Africa, and this is our 34th live guest. I'd like to warmly welcome you all to the season five premiere, and thank you for being with us for this exciting restart of the live guests. I also like to thank our development partners, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for being back with us for this new season. Their support has enabled us to produce a significant body of digital public goods for strategic capacity building in the service of development worldwide. All of this trustworthy knowledge is available for replay on the ID for Africa YouTube library. I like to also welcome those who are new to our community and to remind everyone that we need your support as always to get the word out. If you find the live cast helpful or interesting, please like, share, and subscribe. This simple act tells the Google algorithm that this is content worth proposing to others on YouTube. Because of your efforts, we are now regularly reaching identity stakeholders from 148 countries around the world. As you can see from this impressive map, which illustrates the amazing reach of the live guests globally. So while we continue to be the voice of Africa, we have also become a voice for ID4D worldwide. But there is more that we can do to ensure that no one with interest in identification is left uninformed about the content we are producing together. I thank you in advance for helping your movement in its continued outreach campaign. Also, for those who are new to this medium, let me explain. The live casts and multi-segment sessions of knowledge exchange covering various themes recorded in front of a live Zoom audience. So come for the segment you like, stay for the rest, and always watch what you miss on YouTube. Attending the live recording gives you, however, the chance to interact with the community through the chat, the question and answer, and through the Community Voices platform. You will also benefit from simultaneous English-French interpretation. So we urge you to attend live, at the very least, your segments of direct interest. Today, we have an outstanding lineup. In the first segment, we will have the exceptional opportunity to speak with the Honorable Minister Sina Lawson about Togo's digitalization journey. Then we will dialogue with the leaders of major identity authorities about their business models and practices. And last but not least, we will get an update on Africa's youngest identity program through the Eye on Africa segment. So stick around. This is content you cannot afford not to watch. Also, you will have several opportunities to be elevated onto the three panels through the community voices. Just prepare your camera and raise your hand to register your interest with an operator at the time when I open participation to the audience. But before we launch today's episode, I'd like to briefly look back at ID Day 2022. Many of you were part of the commemorations or have seen the intensity of 16 September online. But from our vantage point, the organization coordinating the campaign, we witnessed a dramatic increase in the number and size of commemorations and in their quality. The activities have definitely delivered well on the intent of the campaign, which is to create awareness on the part of the public and elected officials about this important topic. Here is a map showing all the countries that officially commemorated ID Day. These are official commemorations. There were 32 countries worldwide with 25 in Africa. Of course, the private sector and individuals commemorated the day from across the globe. We would estimate from over 100 countries. We salute all the countries that celebrated officially. Their commemorations included activities that engaged mass media on a scale we have never seen before. On 16 September, there were many radio and television spots that talked about identity and the importance of having it. They engaged with our ambassadors and or with the identity stakeholders and featured political and community leaders. They were all very busy throughout the day, not just with media appearances, but also with well-organized conferences and with public outreach campaigns and rallies, including in rural areas. <clears throat> Tens of thousands of people were mobilized and sensitized through physical meetings in dozens of countries. And this does not count the huge population that was reached through mass media. I urge you to check out the activities page on the ID Day website to see what I am talking about. 
words do not do the day justice. <clears throat> if your country did not participate in this year's events officially, please appeal to your leadership to join the campaign next year. This is a cause worth being part of, so do not miss out on making a positive impact in a world that needs it more than ever. Finally, I want to emphasize ID Day is not about promoting ID systems. It is about promoting individual rights through three identity-related outcomes, inclusion, empowerment, and protection. This message was loud and clear in the commemorations and was explained in the practical guide which we issued a month prior to ID Day. In addition, this year, leading up to the day, we were thrilled to see that the number of coalition partners advocating for the day grew by 45% over last year, reaching 163 organizations. These are important government institutions, development agencies, and NGOs with footprint around the world and without any commercial motivation to push for the day. If your organization is not already a coalition partner, I urge you to join. Time is running out on the SDGs, and we need to escalate our action and regain momentum if we are to meet the objective by 2030. What was heard in the corridors at the UN General Assembly last week raises serious concerns about the world's ability to meaningfully meet the SDG targets. The negative impact of COVID on the SDG progress is deeper than was initially thought. So the world needs you more than ever. Please answer the call. <clears throat> Back to the live casts. Let me now share the program for the next episode, scheduled for October 19. This is going to be yet another fantastic live cast and will consist of four segments. It will start with a short conversation with an acclaimed film director and with the UNHCR about identity in wartime Syria and in times of crisis. We will show an excerpt from the film Forged, which without intending to, gives the best testimony I have ever seen for why identity for all matters. We will then resume the program with a highly anticipated keynote from Patrick Groder from NIST on the state of the art of face recognition. Then we will have a debate about the viability of contactless fingerprints for ID 4 d followed by a spotlight presentation for, from NIST on the topic. Finally, we will have a segment on consumer identity management and ID4D, which unites for the first time on our platform, Google, Microsoft, and MasterCard, to dialogue about the role of consumer-facing organizations in the development agenda. This is another substantial episode filled with original topics not to be found anywhere else. So please mark your calendars. This is content you cannot miss. Now we're ready to start. In today's episode, we are pleased to have with us in the following contributors in the order of appearance. The Honorable Sina Lawson, Minister of Digital Economy and Digital Transformation, Togo. Aliyo Aziz, Director General, CEO, National Identity Management Commission, NIMSI, Nigeria. Tariq Malik, Chairperson, CEO, National Database and Registration Authority, NADRA, Pakistan. Dr. Saurabh Garb, CEO, Unique Identification Authority of India. Unfortunately, Professor Kenneth Atafua, Executive Secretary, National Identification Authority of Ghana, was called to a last meeting, last minute meeting with the President and could not be with us. And then from the Ethiopian National ID Project, we have Yodahe Michael, Executive Director, National ID Program, Office of the Prime Minister, Hanok Ali, Enrollment Operations Director, National ID Program, Maryam Saeed, Digital Economy Advisor, Office of the Prime Minister, Al Shifro, Technical Director, JSI Research and Training Institute, Belayun Yirga, Senior Policy Advisor, Ministry of Justice. Thank you to all the panelists for being with us. We truly appreciate your valuable contributions to this live cast. I look forward to engaging with each of you within the different segments. We are now ready to start the first segment to the point with Minister Sinal Lawson. Operator, please prepare the segment. Minister Lawson, thank you for being with us today. Um, let me remind the, the audience that you are currently the Minister of Digital Economy and Digital Transformation. 
But prior to that, and since 2010, you had several combinations of telecommunication, digital economy, technological innovation, and post in your ministerial portfolio. Your track record on digitalization is very impressive and broadly covers policy, legal, regulatory frameworks, market reforms, fintech innovation, and even COVID-19 response, etc. Minister, we don't have time to list all your accomplishments, but suffice it to say, digital transformation is something you've been living and practicing for a while. So thank you again for taking the time to be with us, to share your insights on a topic that has become a pillar of economic development in the whole world, and of course, in Togo. In Togo, you've been leading the push for digital transforming the country, most recently under the Togo Digital 2025 plan. Minister, perhaps you can start the program by giving the audience a brief overview of what is this plan about? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atik, for inviting me to, to talk to this, uh, to this great event. I also want to thank the whole team of ID4D and um, for the quality of your leadership in uh, organizing the event and in guiding a lot of countries through um, you know, issues related to IDs. Um, so indeed, when I started uh, uh, as a minister in 2010, Togo has had less than 5% internet penetration. And by 2021, we reached 75% uh, internet penetration. Um, so it's to tell you uh, the path that we took. And uh, indeed, when uh, in 2020, 10, the ministry's name was Post and Telecommunications because a lot of issues uh, were related to just, you know, telecom networks. And, um, and, and fast forward to this day, um, we talk a lot more about digital transformation because this is what the country is about, this is what we want to do. So um, to give you a little bit of a background, um, when we talk about digital transformation, actually in, 20, in October 2020, the Togo government um, designed a roadmap and adopted a development roadmap uh, composed of 42 projects and reforms that all the ministries had to execute upon by um, 2025 or at the latest 2030 in order to make sure that we would be on the right track for development. And three fourths of these 42 projects and reforms had a digital component. So because the entire government, you know, the majority of the projects had a digital component, then internally within the Ministry of Digital Transformation, it seemed necessary and crucial for us to come up with a strategy, okay? And so we came up with a strategy and the first question we asked ourselves is, was why would you digitize? Is it for the love of technology? The answer was no, it's not for the love of technology. It's because we want to use digitization as a way to better include our citizens in the country, in society, in the economy. Why does it matter? It's not, uh, Doctor, I think it's not because you're born in a particular territory that you will feel that you belong there. And so it's very important for our citizens to feel that they belong to Togo, that the, the state, the country is giving them back something and they're also contributing. And the way to do that in a very effective, you know, in, in, in a short amount of time is to use digital means. So that's number one. So we said, okay, the purpose in Togo of digitization will be to include our citizens in economy, in, in society. So then we, we felt that we needed, uh, the strategy that we designed had three pillars. The first pillar was all about giving our citizens uh, an identity. This was the, the first pillar we said, okay, Let's, let's think about what are the fundamentals that a country need, every country will need to execute upon in order to be digitized. And in these fundamentals, we had three key, three key programs. Number one was what we thought about, which was connectivity. Like I said, in 2010, we started, it was less than 5% internet penetration. 
up until 2021 when we reached 75%. So the issue of connectivity is a crucial one for us. And when I talk about connectivity, it's true that when you think about Africa, it's all about mobile connection. And we feel that as a country, if we want to move to the future, if we want to be developed, then we need more than just mobile connectivity. We need to deploy fiber optics networks. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So fiber optics ne networks, uh, mobile, very sound mobile connectivity, we want to reach 100% of high-speed internet. So the, that was the first program. The second, and you will appreciate it, which, was, which is um, giving biometric ID to all our citizens. You know, um, it is very, um, as, as, a, as a government, as a state, you, you cannot uh, say that you're serving your citizens if you're not able to identify them and to identify them in a way which is unique. And biometric ID will give us this, you know, the, the, the ability to, to give an ID to all of our citizens. And the third program was to create a unique social registry. Uh, in October, 2020, we were at the middle or, uh, of the pandemic and it seemed very important for us as a country to be able to segment our population based on the level of vulnerability. We didn't have that, okay? We used other ways uh, and we might be able to discuss that. We were able to use artificial intelligence and other things, but as a country, we felt that it was, it belonged to the fundamentals to have, you know, a social registry. So that was, you know, the first pillar. The second pillar was that we felt that we could use digital transformation to really improve um, the delivery of basic services um, of public services. So if you look at it, Joseph, the, um, when we talk about modernizing public services, what we, our commitment as a country was and is, is that by 2025, all public service be available online and uh, be delivered remotely, meaning that you would be able to fill the forms online, pay online, and then you know receive, if that was your choice, receive whatever document through the mail and you would go and fetch it, um, pick it up at the post office. But in order to do that, we need to be able to really identify the people who are requesting the service. So it goes back to one, you give them a biometric ID and a unique numbering. And when they apply to a particular service, they use this unique uh, numbering so that we can deliver it to them. So the first program of the pillar, which, which is about improvement of uh, public service is really digitized public service. It's also digitized uh, basic services, uh, you know, the, uh, when we talk about basic services, we're talking about education, we're talking about health, we're talking about social protection. So to come very quickly to, on, to talk about education and health, we have to say that half of our population is less than 18 and 35, you know, and 75% and of, of, of Africa's population is less than 35 years old. So um, when you think about the, 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 how to use digital transformation, you also have to link it with improving education using digital transformation to modernize education. Obviously health because it's all about the people, what we're doing, and also payment. Um, um, the, uh, one of the commitment we have is that by 2025, the majority of payment, government to citizens, citizens to governance payment, be done again using digital means. Then the third pillar of our strategy was that, okay, the first pillar we said, it's the fundamental, it's including our citizens in the country. The second is about improving the delivery of social and public services. The third is to use digital transformation to support the economy because the most effective way to fight poverty is to increase wealth. So when we talk about digital transformation, we may we, we want to also use it to um, 
to support the economy. And so the first program is how to support um, the key sectors of Togo's economy. We're talking about logistics, financial services, trade, um, agriculture using you know, digital means. The second is that we've, we've, the second program of this pillar is that we've been, we, you know, we benchmarked a lot of countries and we realized that when you talk about digital transformation, the countries that had made the, the most significant progress in digital transformation had their ecosystem actually working with the state working, being leaders in digital transformation. So the support of our ecosystem, training our talent, you know, making sure that the startups and the tech firms grown locally are part of the conversation is very important. And the last program is what we call the how to value data. When you talk about digital transformation, a lot of data is collected, you know, and a lot more will be collected in the future. So the question is, how do you value data? Togo is one of the first countries in West, in, in Africa actually, to have taken a legislation on data privacy. But when we talk about valuing data, it's not just data privacy or cybersecurity, it's also to understand that we need to change the how we view data and our mindset. You know, up until, up until very recently, the state and very often states and the administration look view data as something they collect for their own sake. And in this new economy, data should be collected to be shared with you know, various stakeholders. And it has implications on how you collect data if, if your end goal is to share them with the private sector, with civil society, with other parts of the public sector and the general public. So then that's you know, the, the, the last program of, uh, of our strategy. So three pillars, nine programs, this is Togo's digital transformation strategy. It's, it's excellent. Actually, um, it's very ambitious, very broad. I'd like to sort of drill down a little bit to try to understand some of the specifics that, that you've done. So just, just to summarize what we saw, key, key pillars in, in your digital transformation strategy, Togo 2025, uh, first was the inclusive infrastructure, building infrastructure that would um, give access um, to everybody in society, not only the ones who are in the cities, not only the ones who, have, who are rich, not only the ones who are privileged. Um, the second was basically transforming um, service delivery. Uh, looking at the priority services that exist in your country, making sure by 2025 there is a digital twin where these services can be can be delivered. Uh, third, you talked about the idea that the um, the digital economy uh, needs to be supported by a wise digital transformation, regulatory environment, and infrastructure environment. So, digital economy, e-commerce, etc. Then you talked about basically taking a different look at data governance and ensuring that data is not only protected and the privacy and consent management is done, but also allowing for an understanding of what these data's value is in driving economies. Um, so this is very, very uh, fascinating. Um, and then it, it raises a couple of things in my mind. Um, first of all, let's just get uh, an easy question out of, out of the way. Um, this was launched, and then we've been hit by COVID, which has disrupted uh, most planning and most progress for the last couple of years. And the question I have for you, how, what was the impact of the COVID on Togo 2025? Do you think it has slowed it down, or do you think you're going to be able to achieve your 2025 targets? So it's a great question. You know, COVID, of course, um, um, has in some ways um, helped us in terms of digital transformation. And if you talk to all the um, digital transformation ministers in the world, they will tell you the same thing. All of a sudden, we were faced with the issue of how to deliver services without physically interacting with people because we needed to have mobility restriction me measures, how to, um, how to uh, deliver, again, pay, uh, fi give financial support to uh, 
to, to citizens without meeting them, um, how to be more effective in terms of logistics. So um, with COVID, we had to prioritize a um, few projects that we were planning to do later down, uh, down the road because, hey, from, from one day to another, it became very urgent to find new ways to delivering these services. So I would say that it's, um, COVID showed us the importance of digital transformation. Some of the projects that would have been much more complicated for our ministry to execute upon because the other stakeholders, because you know, as a digital transformation ministry, we're really there to support all of other, you know, other, other ministries. So in some instances, it might be complicated that to co convince them that they need to digitize. And what happened during the pandemic was a digitization by necessity. For example, and it, in, it, it actually enabled us to enter through the back door, I would say. For example, if I take the example of health, during the pandemic, we had to digitize the vaccine uh, administration process. We had to digitize the COVID testing process. Um, so all of a sudden, we started to digitize few um, parts of the Ministry uh, of, of Health. Uh, I think that prior to the pandemic, it might, take, it might have taken longer to convince them that we needed to start building these databases and processes. So in some ways, it was very helpful. In others, because of course, uh, it, 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 it takes a lot of resources. Oh, but I want to say something else is that we, within the ministry, we have this um, vision that digital means and digital transformation um, has to be um, done for the good of, of our country. So it, again, it, because it's never about the technology, what is important is the methodology that you apply when you, um, you build a digital transformation project. And um, while I'm talking about methodology is that, for example, when we started to do cash transfers, we would inform our citizens on a daily basis in a very transparent manner of how much money was spent. So for us, yes, to come to your, um, to answer your question, um, some projects might have been delayed, but I think that the most important is that everybody now understands the value of digitization. Everybody agrees we need to do it and everybody is, understanding the value of applying a new or an improved methodology and a lot more transparency in what we do. Excellent. So basically, COVID, while it might have disrupted some of the operations, it gave a bigger boost to the motivation of why you're, why you're trying to do this. It's an existence proof of the impact of digitalization and why no country should be without it. Now, you, you've said a couple of things about the good of the people, etc. And that raises the issue when we talk about um, digital availability. And there are a couple of things that are involved here. One is that you have invested in the infrastructure, um, cell towers for the mobile access, fiber optics for allowing uh, offices and schools and, and, and clinics and facilities to be linked to the backbone of the internet. But there's also the question of affordability. I mean, Togo continues to be a country where one in two people is considered below the poverty line. Do you think you can build a regulatory and policy to ensure that, that the private sector makes available services and, and, and the equipment just like mobile data plans or, or data access plans and devices that are affordable by the poor? Yes, so, um, so there are actually a couple, three things I want to say. The first is that, uh, as you understand, when we talk about uh, digital infrastructure uh, connectivity, it's, it's done with the private sector, and oftentimes we do public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. When you talk about affordability, we have the affordability of um, services, and the affordability of equipment. And you're, you're raising a very, very important point, which is that in Africa right now, and actually in the, in, in the developing world, uh, the majority of mobile phones circulating on the continent 
are 2G only phones, okay? Right. When we go and see mobile operators telling them to deploy 4G networks, they come back to us saying, but for how many people? Because people don't have these, the phones that enable them to connect to our network. So for us, the business case of having 4G is not there. And so it takes a lot of our leadership to say, we're in a, a point of time which, in which we should say, and that's what we tell telecom operators, build and they will come. It's a leap of faith, just as it was a leap of faith 20 years ago when there was no mobile connectivity on the continent. A lot of people at that time said, whatever for. And so the, for, with regards to the issue of affordability, what we did in Togo was that we reinforced the role of the regulatory agency. Mm -hmm. More control, more sanction in terms of quality of services, looking at prices, benchmarking them. But um, looking into the future, um, we think that for our country to reach and, um, and to be able to be um, developed, we need to improve a lot more connectivity at a very affordable price. When I say increase a lot more connectivity, again, I'm thinking about fiber optics network. You know, you did say, and you're right, that Togo remains very expensive with regards to the fact that, you know, half of the population lives below poverty lines. And so as a state, we need to take some decision in terms of how we should subsidize, you know, the price of connectivity. And I'm thinking of very high speed internet um, because the private sector won't do it because it's not, yeah. it's not uh, uh, profitable enough for them. So um, we are working on a model right now um, to deploy fiber optics networks using power lines, electrical networks. And um, we have launched some uh, studies to also uh, see how much of subsidies, what model we should uh, implement to make sure that it is affordable. So it's a key issue. It's a very key issue for all African countries, uh, which is how to provide our citizens with the, you know, the most effective broadband at the cheapest price possible. And I think that as a country, we will have to uh, step up and subsidize, you know, the most vulnerable Togolese. Do you have a universal access fund which basically taxes the telecom and, and subsidizes regions which are remote and not financially viable? Where do you stand in policy of that kind? Has it worked? Has it not worked? Where, where do you stand? So it has worked, but it's, it's, it's not enough. The fact mm -hmm. is that it is, it is uh, effective because the universal um, service fund serves to uh, uh, provide uh, telcos with funding to go to uh, areas where there's nothing, you know, we call right. that white, um, white space or, or, or these, you know, remote areas. But what we're talking about is that if for the country, because the price of equipment is not something, especially for a country like Togo, which is, uh, which has 7 million inhabitants, the telcos will tell you that they buy the, you know, the, the price of equipment, the same as a, another um, um, large country which would have more assistance. So, so, so that the cost, the capex of deploying networks remains pretty much, you know, the same for a smaller number of clients. So for us really is that we have, and, 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 and Doctor, I think this is a great question. We have to come up, especially small countries, we have to come up with new models to support uh, the poorest. And I think the Universal Service Fund is not going to be enough for what we're trying to achieve. Um, and, and this seems to be what, what we've came up, came to the conclusion in, in prior live casts and discussing with experts in that area. But do you, are you aware of any policies today that, that, that work in that regard? Or are you uh, in, the, in the position to share with us some of your thoughts and, and hopes for what, what could make the service uh, affordable, 
broadband service affordable so that everybody, um, and, and especially men, women, anybody in rural areas, the ones that are vulnerable can join in this revolution that, that you've outlined a vision for? Um, so I would say that uh, we need to look at maybe outside of the continent. I think that in terms of policies, governments, and we would have to take the decision that we need to put money on the table to de-risk any infrastructure investment that we deem necessary. And, um, you know, um, it's 20, I mean, in the 1990s uh, and the years 2000, um, the most state decided to pull away uh, from uh, investment in telecom infrastructure to let the private sector invest. And it made sense, right? But now we're talking about uh, leapfrogging. We're talking about um, 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 the fourth industrial revolution. And, and if we want to be there in a record time, we need to build new models. And, yeah. and from my perspective, okay, I could see a, a, a model by which um, we would come up maybe with half the amount and the private sector would organize themselves to bring uh, another part of the amount and we would deploy networks. And because we, we, we came up with money to de-risk the project, then we would, as part of the relationship, have a say on how much the service, the basic service should be sold. You see, and I think that this is some work that we've been working on in Togo, but this is what I, I think would work actually. But it would require, and it will require, us government to put it to put in a large chunk of the money. It's not that it cannot be done by the private sector. It can be done in twenty years. But if yes. we want it to be done in three years, we need yes. to find a new model, and we need to do it ourselves. You know, and we need yeah, to. You, you know, it's 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 money that we're putting on the table for which we don't need any financial returns. We just want a social return from this money. You, you raise a very important point, Minister, which is that we cannot, we can no longer uh, allow market uh, forces to uh, dictate the digital transformation of a country because digital inclusion is a human right. I don't know if you believe in that principle. Absolutely. If you believe it and that everybody needs to get there, we cannot wait until it becomes commercially viable for us to see what you've said 20 years later. So message, very important message, if I'm trying to paraphrase you, would be that governments, you need to step in, regulators and, and finance departments understand that this is an infrastructure that has to be accelerated, otherwise the divide in the country will become bigger, those who have access and those who don't. So, yes. and, and Dr. Atik, if you may, um, even going further than that, I'm saying let's be ambitious for the continent. Let's, when we talk about broadband, let's talk about fiber optics. Because, uh -huh. I, 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 and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that um, we don't have enough imagination today uh, to see what Africa could become if the majority of households were connected to fiber at $5 per month, say. Exactly. It would transform the continent forever. It would be the, the basics that we need, the basis that we need to be able to really be fully developed on our own terms because Africans are very creative, have very creative minds. So, you know, the day we give that level of you know connectivity, then the sky will be the limit as to what we can you know do. Right. And so that's well, that's our dream and our vision. Well said, well said. So infrastructure, there is something that could be done. Fiber, mobile, the government needs to intervene to make sure access is universal, to make sure it's affordable, and to make sure that services are, are being driven so that it motivates the adoption of, of this type of infrastructure. Let me switch quickly, before we take questions, there are lots of questions, but let me switch quickly to another important ingredient in the digital transformation, which is essentially 
building the digital government platforms. Um, you mentioned one of them. You are in the process of developing a foundational uh, digital ID program that will serve as an anchor for the government platform in Togo. So maybe you can you can um, present to us what is this digital ID program? What demand is driving it? So, um, so we are actually working with the World Bank uh, that has uh, provided us with funding for uh, the two programs um, of biometric ID and unique numbering and also social registry. So uh, the team, so we're part of this uh, project with the World Bank Wuri project. And we are also, we decided as a country to use uh, MOZIP uh, to build our national ID system because, and MOZIP is, um, was developed uh, in uh, India. I guess that every, the community of ID4D knows MOZIP very well. It's an open source platform. And so um, the, the, when thinking about what we want to achieve in, 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 in Togo and um, the different platforms that we need to build for us, it was very important to build using open source and to be able to co-develop. You know, this idea of co-development being part of the conversation uh, was very important. The idea, and because when you talk about co-development, you're also talking about sovereignty. You know, you want to be part of a solution, Africa needs to be part of a solution. There is also the idea of security and data privacy, because when you talk about biometric ID, it's very important to keep in mind that the issue of security and data privacy is key. So our, um, so with the World Bank, we received $72 million to be able to deploy biometric ID and unique numbering to all of our citizens. Our goal is to start early 2022 deploying this. Right now we are at a, at a stage where we are, um, we have, we, we're starting the, the technical, working on the technical platform but it's not only for Togo. The vision we have, the vision of, you know, is that all of Africa be on a, an ID platform. Uh, and so the idea to be able to, at some point, to interconnect with our neighboring countries and other countries of the continent is also key to what we're doing. So, so, so because we think that we've, a digital ID, not only will we be able to better serve our citizens, but we also want to be able to interconnect with other countries in the country, other countries on the continent. Talking about interconnection, I also want to do, I also want to say that, so we are building our digital transformation using different, um, I would say layers, different stacks. So ID is a stack, but mm -hmm. we also mentioned the payment layer, which was a very important yep. for us. Um, the, the fact that the platform that we are building at the government level has to uh, allow for interoperability. We need, you know, I'm um, having this conversation and we are in 2022 and we have to acknowledge that other countries on other continents have done this, you know, 20 years ago. So we decided, uh, and so it, you know, it's, it's very important to learn from other people's successes and mistakes. And so when we're building all these platforms today, learning from what happened in other parts of the world, we want to make sure that everything we do is, is interoperable and allows for the ecosystem to participate. I'm glad you mentioned the ecosystem because in fact, you do have some identity assets already in Togo, and it was very impressive how in, in the COVID response in 2020, in the Novici uh, project, you actually used an existing database together with other information from other ministries to create a sort of an ad hoc uh, social register to try to target those who need cash transfers. And you also, also leverage mobile money. So you are not all for just throw everything out and build something new, you were able to leverage. So how do you see the existing assets um, that exist for identity in Togo being leveraged in this program? For example, 
uh, will you be linking this to birth registration, which uh, essentially is lagging in, 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 in Togo? Are you doing civil registration reform? Um, or you think legal identity can wait, you need economic identity first? Okay, so, um, so many things. Number one, um, during the pandemic, um, when we wanted, when we decided that we were going to provide our citizens with financial aid, we needed to have biometric ID. The, right. the first COVID case we had uh, hit us less than a month after the, uh, the presidential elections. Right. So, so uh, um, most of our citizens had an up-to-date biometric voters ID. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that because uh, in Togo, in terms of biometric ID, you have national ID and you have voters ID. National ID because that it costs uh, cost uh, less than $10 to, to, um, to have, but um, the majority of the citizens um, had rather the voter's ID because it was free. So 93% of all Togolese adults had a voter's ID. So you had 3.6 million voter's ID compared to 1.2 million um, national ID. So we used voter's ID, but your voter's IDs are for people who are 18 years and older, okay? So now when we talk about social protection, so we would have been, it would have been very hard for us to build policies for people who were uh, younger than 18 years because they didn't have voter's ID. So that's why it's so important now to have a, a biometric ID for all the citizens. So so, so that, that's you know, point number one. Number two is that you're right that the majority of the poor, poor people don't have, um, um, civil registries, they don't have birth certificates. Mm -hmm. So one component of the biometric ID project is to actually work on um, providing, um, a, a, um, actually uh, reforming uh, civil registries in Togo. But you are very aware that it costs a lot of money because uh, yes. you have to deal with the past, you have to digitize the past and, and organize for the future. And, and, and it's very decentralized, so, so it's, it's, it's tedious. So what we want to do is that, first of all, we don't want to link it with EID. We want to deploy EID because we want to solve you know, the ID problem now, but we're fully aware that if we don't reform and modernize civil registry, then all the work we're doing with EID, the, the database will be obsolete. You know, it won't be up to date. So it's parallel programs that we're launching. You know, everyone, every program has its own tracks and it's parallel. And we are hoping that we will solve both problems, you know, both, both issues. So again, it's, it's not that we're excluding one, we're doing everything at the same time. Now, what is your strategy then to build the national population register? Because now you're starting essentially, you're saying, I want to do a biometric enrollment of the entire population, which I assume also uh, people below the age of 18. What is your national strategy? Will you launch an enrollment campaign? When will it start? What can you expect? Will that be done in a manner uh, as, a, as a registrar, you outsource it, or will it be the ministry's own people who are going to do that process? Maybe you have not gotten those decisions all done, but what's your thinking? So, so, um, so we have a, a national ID agency, ANID, in charge of uh, deploying, you know, uh, the the ID, uh, actually having the leadership over the ID project. So the ID project, we have different components. We have the technical solution component, and we have the campaign component. The when we when we call we say the campaign is how do you deploy people in the field and register these these people and and we we we're doing it through a a, a public tender uh, hiring a company that will be in charge of actually registering people on behalf of this ID agency. Uh, but you're very you're fully aware that uh, it's it's a tedious process yeah. that requires that requires a lot of you know, people to participate in terms of organization. So it, we felt that it was, it was only fair that we hire a company that had um, you know, experience in doing so. Um, but we also think that as a, as, as a, as a state, 
we have experience and uh, knowledge uh, in terms of what needs to be done for a, a, an ID registration campaign since we have presidential you know, voters ID for you know, several campaigns. So we are going to be very demanding uh, uh, on uh, towards the company that execute on this because we want it to be done properly. It's very important for us because right. of the success of Novici, uh, the majority of the poor, you know, uh, the, the poorest Togolese today understand the value of having an ID. Prior to that, it was just used for a few things to vote, etc. Now they understand the value. So we want to execute very, very quickly and have very clean database. Right. And uh, OK, so let, let me interrupt one second and, and launch a call for community voices. <clears throat> if anyone would like to join us on this panel was for a brief um, question on direct with, with Minister Lawson. Please raise your hand and the operator will bring you on. Um, in the meantime, um, Minister, the you mentioned something in the discussion early on, something about co-develop. That assumes that the entrepreneurial and the development ecosystem in Togo uh, permits the emergence of talent and skills that are in the private sector um, but are also available to the government. What policies and programs have you been putting in place to encourage digital entrepreneurship and digital skills development? So um, we're working on a digital transformation act as we speak with um, incentives provided to innovative and tech companies. But that's number one, but incentives alone are not enough. We're also working with the university in order to support them in what they call their own transformation, the modernization of how STEMs are taught at the graduate you know, level, at the university level. Um, when we were talking about, because you know, when we talk about ecosystem is really about, do you have the talent? You know, do you have the critical mass in terms of talent? And then how do you support the talent that are already there? But talents are not, a, a, it's a pool that we need uh, to grow every, every, every time. So the quality of digital skills, the, the quality of education does matter. So we're working on this through policies, supporting the university and also, uh, and, and that circles back to the issue of connectivity because it's of course not about higher education only, it's about making sure that from the very first day uh, kids enter school till the day they have their baccalaureate and their uh, post, you know, um, the university degree that these skill sets are well taught. So it requires again digitization and it requires us to make sure that schools and education, schools are connected, that the basic services are digitized. So all these questions are relevant. Everything is happening at the same time. But again, I would say that the first, at the end of the day, the first and most important thing we need to do is to make sure the infrastructure is there. Because once the infrastructure is there, if you have people who are very, you know, uh, have a lot of imagination, uh, are very committed to what they want to be doing, they'll find a way to do it. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, Minister, we have with us uh, Peter. Peter, could you present yourself, who you are with, and state your question for the Honorable Minister? Uh, thank you very much, Joseph. My name is Peter Kmaile from Kenya. I've just been appointed chairman of African Committee of Experts on Digital IT. Um, I want to appreciate the presentation by Honorable Minister and most importantly, appreciate the strides they have done in Togo in terms of, um, in terms of developing um, an ID system uh, based on uh, what uh, the Committee of Experts is up to do, uh, looking at um, developing with an environment of being futuristic, um, I have heard us talk about um, the other system which will have a capability of uh, integration with other systems across Africa. Uh, my point was to comment uh, Togo for that, and most importantly on the issue of the infrastructure. Uh, mm -hmm. They seem to have really leveraged 
on, uh, on the coronavirus to digitize uh, most of the services, especially in the health sector and also yeah. in the economy. So thank you very much. Mine was just a comment and appreciate that. Joseph, I think uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be discussing and meeting more on these forums. Um, I'm now the chairman of African Committee of Experts on Digital IT. Welcome. ID. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Um, Minister, there's a question. Um, there are many questions, but one is, is most pertinent. I would like to um, I'd like to ask you before we, we move on. We don't have much time. Um, the question from Paul Johnson says, the Honorable Minister, in terms of your biometric data, is this centralized and then verified in real time? Or is it data held at the citizen end along with the verification credentials, inter alia, smart card, or a mobile device? If they're basically talking about will the data be collected and put in a database and deduplicated, or will it be carried in a mobile device and a smart or a smart card by the citizen? I think that um, it will be uh, centralized. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure of the question because. Um, so, so, so you have two things. Number one is that it has to be centralized because you need yes. authentic authentication, okay? So authentication will be uh, um, against a database that is, uh, you know, secured and stored somewhere. And then the question maybe you're asking is what part of the data will be carried upon uh, by individual citizens? I guess that for me, it's, um, it, 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 it's yet another layer. Right now, we are just dealing with the basic layer, which is provide ID and unique, unique numbering enables for authentication on a database that is centralized. Right. Okay. Um, so basically, a database centralized to deduplicate and to ensure the uniqueness, issue a unique ID number, and then later on, for authentication purposes, you can decide what identifiers can be carried, if you want a smart card, if you want a phone. Uh, you are now only in the stage of building the foundational ID, and then thank you. Okay, uh, that's great. Um, in order to, in closing, I'd like to ask you um, to give your vision about the legal ecosystem that you think governments should have in place before or along the process that such a system which collects a lot of data and also um, requires people to provide data. What is the ecosystem? enabling ecosystem, um, legal ecosystem for these type of government uh, digital ID programs that you think government should pay attention to? So many things. Um, I think that um, in, we, 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 we ought to have a legal and regulatory framework with regards to biometric ID, the use of it, with regards to cybersecurity, with regards to critical infrastructure, with regards to data privacy, with regards to building a social registry, uh, with regards to um, um, regional cooperation, you know, Togo um, um, through the Lomé Declaration has gathered, had gathered a few months ago, uh, working with the UN, the UNECA, uh, convened, we convened a, 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 a summit on cybersecurity and we committed and the countries that participated uh, to this summit committed that, that they would cooperate in terms of cybersecurity. So all these issues are linked and regulations should be harmonized um, in, in order to make sure that it happens. But then it's not, about, it's not about taking the regulation, it's also about training those who are going to be making sure the regulation is respected that they can do their, you know, they work effectively. So there's a lot of training and hiring of individuals that are ongoing right now in Togo. Um, fantastic. I, um, Minister, we've ran out of time. There's a, this is a very rich topic and obviously one that we will continue to, um, to monitor. Um, I will issue you a direct invitation to join us in the annual uh, augmented general meeting, which will be held in, um, in Kenya in uh, May of 2023, uh, in order for us to continue this conversation. But in the meantime, I sincerely thank you for your generosity, your time, and sharing with us your insights. I wish we had two more hours to dedicate to your thoughts. Thank you. Dr. Thank you very much for inviting me 
for letting, letting me uh, or letting us share Togo's experience. And also thank you for the quality of your commitment. Uh, we've known each other for many years and uh, you carried on uh, with uh, ID4D. I think it's, it's beautiful, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, you had a vision when a lot of people did, just didn't understand what it was you know, about, what ID was about and how it could be implemented in Africa. So, so I want to thank you for, 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 for your leadership. Thank you so much and look forward to continuing this collaboration. Uh, à très bientôt. Merci, au revoir. Wow. Uh, operator, um, let us prepare the second uh, segment which is going to focus on the business models of the identity authorities. Let us welcome the director generals and CEOs of the three um, identity authorities that are with us. Um, we, of course, we have NIMSI, we have um, the UIDA of India, and of course, NADRA. Um, to get, uh, again, gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us um, to just give our, our audience a little bit of perspective, I want to remind them that your organizations have been around. Um, for example, NADRA has been around, I think, for 22 years. Uh, NIMSI has been around for 15 years. And of course, UID is the new kid on the block, but it's 14 years old already. So it's amazing, we, 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 you know, you've been around for a while and therefore it means you're doing something right. And so in this segment, I am keen to understand how your organizations have been sustained and more importantly, going forward, what business models do you intend to adopt to remain viable and meet the evolving needs of your populations? So, so, so many young identity authorities are listening, are online, are keen to learn from your experience and plans. So I wanna start this with a situation analysis. So let us uh, begin um, and understand the governance and institutional arrangement um, of, of your authorities. Let, let me start with NIMSI, then go to UA, UID, and then let's go to NADRA. So what is your governance structure what is your organization, um, institutional arrangement? How is it structured? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman Attic. Uh, as, you, as you know, NIMSI has been over the years some the role to, uh, that we evolved from being the central um, ID agency uh, let me say, having the whole vertical structure of enrolling, uh, deduplication, and also providing the uh, unique identity and also a, a token in terms of a, a smartphone. So we we evolved, and we we were we started from being in the presidency, in the uh, uh, and then now we have been moved to uh, appropriately. In the, in the Ministry of uh, Communications and Digital Economy. And I believe that is part of the, what the Honorable Minister used to always say is that in this digital economy, we need the digital identity as the, as the foundation, including with uh, the Minister have already stated that in this 21st century, you need a, a mobile phone. You also need a, a, a broad, uh, broad, broad, uh, broadband, and also you need a, a smart, a smart wallet to really mm -hmm. exist. And therefore, we we have a a board, and a board that is generally made of the chairman. And currently, we have a very new chairman and also all the other agencies that have been capturing data from immigration the, uh, from immigration to the driver's license and then the, the, the civil registration, uh, the voters registration, all of them are in that board. Then we have the, uh, my humble self, the DG, we have the management and also we have staff, we have all over the nation we have more, almost 4,000 strong that are capturing data for government. And now we also have a, a, 
a PPP program whereby we outsource, we have more than uh, 30,000 30, uh, systems uh, nationwide that have been capturing data. As you know, Nigeria, we, we grow almost every year, we add seven, more, seven million more. That is like adding uh, Togo every year. Therefore, we have to have a very large uh, enrollment system to, to provide. So we have evolved from that vertical stack to a horizontal stack whereby we want, we want to more and more regulate the ID sector while we are still capturing. So specifically the ID ecosystem and the authority in Nigeria with the role of NIMSI as uh, currently is to provide uh, standards and uh, specifications for participation of the public and private sectors in the data capture service. We also store the data that is collected. So we have a centralized uh, 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 data, data center, as we said. We assign also issue a unique identifier because the biometrics data that have been collected needs to be de duplicate before we get before we get uh, we generate the national ad a unique identification number, and we also coordinate harmonization of the legacy government databases. Before us, there are other government agencies that have been capturing data, including even the biometrics data. All these things have to be. Uh, harmonize because every government is one single government that is made of, of many agencies. Therefore, they need to be harmonized. And we also provide a platform for ID tokens, authentication and verification. So we'll, like- We'll uh, come back. We'll, we'll come back to that, the uh, uh, So oh, uh, now I was I was some time. I don't know, sorry. I don't know no, where- no, that's I, okay. Okay. That, that's okay. Your, your so, institutional arrangement and governance is now very clear. You are part of a ministry, which is now basically the one that is driving the digital identity agenda in, in Nigeria, because basically digital transformation and digital economy is yeah. the new, essentially, uh, uh, sure. population registry which used exactly. to be in the in old days in the Ministry of Interior or with commissions. Now we're seeing more and more of the digital economy ministers being yeah. the drivers in that. Hold on to that thought. I'll come back to you. Um, Dr. Gark, what, what is the sort of institutional arrangement and the governance structure of the UID authority? Uh, please unmute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on your event. And it's a pleasure to be here on this panel. Thank you. Talk of our institutional structure. We are a part of the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, uh, which is our parent ministry. And we are a statutory authority in the sense there is an Aadhaar Act, which has been passed by the parliament, uh, which sets out the roles and functions of the UIDAI. And uh, is this act uh, which provides the different powers and what the authority can do. And um, in fact, all uh, policy matters and implementation matters uh, related to the digital identity are uh, vested with the authority. Um, there is a chief executive officer uh, of the authority who holds the administrative and financial powers which in, uh, in the present case, I'm, I, I hold that position. Uh, and we have an authority board, uh, which consists of um, part-time members who provide uh, um, a mentoring support and guidance uh, to the work of the authority. Uh, as an authority, we have offices uh, across the country uh, who work with the state governments in the implementation projects. And we also work with a lot of ecosystem partners uh, in from the private sector uh, who work on our technology issues on the enrollment authentication. And we uh, set out the rules and regulations uh, for governing it. Uh, the authority also has uh, uh, authority for penal provisions 
uh, on in case there are any uh, fraud or mismanagement that happens and uh, uh, the authority uh, has the ability to staff its uh, itself in the manner uh, which it best uh, seems uh, desirable to achieve its objectives. Excellent. Okay. Um, and so let me move on to ANADRA and understand their institutional arrangement and governance structure so that we can see what are the commonalities between, between the three before we move on to the next important issue that I'll guide you through. Thank you very much, Dr. Atik and uh, uh, esteemed panelists, uh, all my friends to see you uh, live um, and inviting me on this uh, August uh, platform. Uh, the arrangement is uh, the same uh, as India, uh, you know, but uh, Nadra Authority was established a long way back uh, before Aadhaar came in. And so we uh, have, uh, we are, we are uh, also working in the same fashion. We have a Nadra Act uh, that is uh, an act of the parliament. And so it has, it stipulates the powers and the functions and the, uh, you know, even the rules and regulation regarding issuance of identity documents and uh, uh, the, SOPs and policies then flows out of that NADRA Act. Um, we, uh, our summaries are moved to the federal government via uh, Ministry of Interior, but we are not an attached department of Ministry of Interior. It is more of an independent authority. And when we say uh, authority, it's an authority for a reason. And so it's a semi-autonomous body and so uh, it is run by independent board and these are industry specialists and uh, they advise uh, and mentor and uh, they are sort of trusted advisor to the chairperson of Nadra. So in the same fashion, you know, we are working, but we have more sort of autonomy. I am appointed by the federal government, not by the ministry and the cabinet. So so are the members of NADRA board, which, are, uh, which work for a fee. And mm -hmm. they are also uh, employed by, through worldwide competitive process. Now, Tariq, do you see any advantages to being an independent authority instead of being part of a, of a ministry? Yes. Okay. Absolutely, because uh, you know, we, uh, an identity uh, authority, uh, should not be captured by the government. It is an authority for the state. It, it protects the civil liberties of the people of that state. So it should, uh, you know, it should have independent board and the person who is heading the agency should uh, uh, be able to perform this balancing act. It should be able to enhance the state institution's capacity but at the same time, you know, protect the civil liberties of the citizen, protect the, the, their privacy and protect the security of the data so that the state uh, or the government should not become the big brother, uh, if you will. So uh, I think the legislative framework should be very strong and the uh, administrative arrangement should be strong so that uh, you know uh, a, a, so that no capture can take place that's that's why let, it is okay let, let me give the opportunity to the other two panelists to chime in if they feel because from from my perspective if you are providing infrastructure for the country being part of an infrastructure ministry might make sense uh, so if you it depends how you look at it um, if uh, Dr. Garg or, or DJ Aziz, do you want to comment on what do you think is the ideal um, institutional arrangement um, that, that, that identity authorities should be aiming for, and especially for greenfield identity authorities, which are now popping up around Africa? I know that you've inherited the identity authorities that you are now leaders of. Um, so if you care to comment, please chime in. Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I would be. Uh, Dr. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, 
I, as you correctly mentioned, uh, digital identity, uh, we consider it as the uh, digital rails for the digital economy, uh, just as the infrastructure railway railways are for the infra, for the uh, for the um, mainstream for the physical economy. And to that extent, uh, these digital rails or the digital infrastructure is a public good, uh, which especially uh, in the Indian context, uh, which has a clear constitutional mandate for being a welfare state, uh, is uh, being used extensively for uh, delivering benefits, uh, services, and subsidies uh, to the people. And it has especially been seen that it is especially useful for the most uh, vulnerable and the marginalized people of the society. So keeping in view the uh, overall objective of it being a public good, it being a public infrastructure, um, I would strongly view that uh, uh, it being part of the government definitely helps. But I recognize the point uh, that my colleague was making uh, that digital identity uh, has to take care of privacy and confidentiality issues, and that need to be built in into uh, these into the act. For example, in our case, and more importantly, into the functioning, so that the credibility of the organization is in no way impacted uh, by the fact that uh, it is going to be working with the government. So as long as we can ensure. Uh, that uh, that relationship and that clarity of objective, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, it will help both in terms of the infrastructure part and the credibility issue. Excellent. Well, well said. Um, DJ Aziz, we'd like to chime okay. in. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, digital ID being the foundation of almost everything that we do, uh, and it, actually, it will depend on each country uh, uh, legacy systems that you have and how the country is really structured. So in terms, like in Nigeria, when NIMSI came in, there, there are many agencies that have been capturing uh, data. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the idea was to have a super agency that will also have all the stakeholders from all these other agencies to be part of the system. And also to understand that uh, this data belongs to the citizen. So the agency will be holding that data on trust. And also that uh, nowadays, though there have been a public cry of public private partnership, it has to be still be public-private partnership because even in the UK, they are now talking about uh, having a public power, power supply on public railway stations. And meanwhile, it has been privatized before, but when you have issues, you can change. So the whole system is that, or the whole need is that the data of citizens have to be, a uh, government must know the citizen that we need to capture the data. We have to build trust into the system to make sure that, uh, that everybody participates as we empower the citizen in this 21st century to own their IDs. Thank you. Right, so, so basically um, as a custodian of data, do you, do you feel that, that um, being part of a ministry versus an independent authority makes any difference. I mean, the mandate is clear, but will it be, in your opinion, preferable to be independent or will it be um, preferable to be part of a ministry that is a public good ministry that is transforming the, 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 the infrastructure in the country? What, what, what would you think, if you were to advise a country that is setting up an identity authority, what would you say? Well, I, 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 from my own experience, I have participated from being a super agency that has been placed in the, in the presidency. And right. then, the, 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 then the argument is that we have now set up an, a digital economy and that we wanted to do e-governance also. 
and that identity is the platform for both of these services. Therefore, the right place to be is in the, uh, the new Ministry of Communications and Digital Economy. And also, but uh, more of commitment. In Nigeria, my, my experience of being independent is like the, uh, the voters' uh, uh, commission, uh, INEC, that is the, for election. So, and it seems like um, they, they, they are totally independent and it is more of political, a political system that mm. comes every four years with very high speed. But meanwhile, identity every day, somebody is being born, somebody okay. is dying, somebody needs a service. It is a continuous process. It's not going to be in the, in the mindset of uh, that independence that we are talking about, more of a government service because it's provides that service to the government. Okay, Thank you. very good. So, so we, we do have um, two organizational structure institutional arrangements um, with some preference I'm seeing uh, to be in the in the um, basically the digital economy and providing digital identity to enabling services and part of the government. Um, both the three of you um, highlighted a very important point, which is the assets that you would consider as your assets. So if I go back to Tariq, um, Tariq, what would you consider as, as Nadra's assets? Uh, people, infrastructure, and data. So these okay. three are the main uh, assets. The technical resource that we, over the period of time, we have developed and trained, and they have institutional knowledge and the infrastructure that we have invested and we keep on investing that, on that, and the data that we have. Data is, is the big asset. Data is the oil for us. And we mm. guard it very passionately. How big is the population register of NADRA right now? NADRA has registered about 97% of adult population. And that comes to uh, 121 million adult people, but we have started registering children and uh, we have come up with the inclusive registration department where we are issuing the identities, for example, to refugees, not only Pakistanis, but aliens, foreigner IDs, and some other IDs so that everybody should have a unique ID. So okay. overall, if you see that, uh, you know, we have issued so far 189 million identities. We take uh, 10 fingerprints, photograph, uh, I mean, digital photograph and uh, digital signature also. And we are in process of implementing the iris as well. Okay, great. So you, you do have some really valuable assets, uh, not the least of which is an enormous amount of database. Um, yes. Dr. Garg. Um, what would you describe as your, your assets? Uh, I think uh, the biggest uh, and the most important um, asset that we have uh, is the uh, biometric uh, data of our residents and the demographic data of the residents. So the biometrics are the 10 fingerprints, the two iris scans, and the face, the photograph. And the demographics are of five fields we only keep, it's minimal uh, architecture that we have of the name, gender, date of birth, address, and along with the address, very often uh, the parents' name is associated. So this is the minimal data that we have, uh, but we have this data, we, we showed around 1.35 uh, billion uh, uh, adhars uh, over the past uh, 10 years, and we've reached a stage that 100% of adults who are resident in India, we have above the age of 18, uh, they have been issued Aadhaars, the identity cards. Uh, we are in fact searching for remote areas, etc., where uh, there might be some people left out. Between the ages of six to 18, it's around 93%. So by the time a person has reached 18, uh, the person would be having an Aadhaar. And between zero to five, uh, that's a moving target because every year we have around uh, uh, 25 to 30 million births. 
So that's a moving. So between the ages of zero to five, we have around 30 to 40% saturation in terms of, uh, we are now in the process of linking uh, issue of the digital identity at the time of birth. So along with the birth certificate, we would issue. So I'm sure this penetration would also increase. So uh, that is where we are. And obviously uh, this biometric data and the demographic data is something uh, uh, which uh, is the most important asset and therefore the need for enhanced cybersecurity and the various other firewalls and other end of end security products that we keep on updating. Clearly, wonderful. So in addition, uh, once again, data is, is one of the biggest assets that you have at your institution owns. Imagine, imagine a day where the, the entire data is deleted and you have to start from scratch. I don't think it's imaginable. <laughs> Absolutely, we won't like to even think of that situation. <laughs> I don't think it's imaginable. DJ Aziz, so tell us about yeah. the assets, Jimsi. Yes, uh, it, as you said, it takes time to enroll people into the database. And that is what the minister took uh, earlier said. And you can, re you can replace the servers, the switches, and then the, the, uh, all the technical equipment. But uh, the data that you have, it takes time to, to replace to replace that. Therefore, it is really the data, the, mm -hmm. dem both the demographic and also the, the uh, biometrics data that has been stated. We, we captured up to close to 90 million now, which is about 43% of the, of, the, uh, of the population. And, uh, and mind you, because we are growing too, the data is, uh, the need for the identity is growing, and and that um, we capture uh, both the ten fingerprints and also the face. Uh, we have not started capturing the iris, but we have at the back end we already have the iris, and it is uh, there on the middle where that for people that wants to uh, utilize utilize it. So, and we are thinking that most of the capturing because of the uh, it's, it's open for everyone from age zero to two. Uh, but, uh, but majority of people think that until when they are 16 or 19 to, uh, or 18 to register. So mm -hmm. up till now we do get calls that can I take my children? Yes, well, uh, children can. can be uh, registered provided that one of the parent or guardian is already registered so that we capture uh, the data together. So this 21st century, and it is the data that is the new oil right. and the most important asset. So I think, I think in addition to the fact that all three organizations capture 10 print, which is biometric fingerprint, so that there is a standard. I mean, right now you cannot run a large scale ID program, biometric ID program without capturing fingerprints. This is a commonality. All three of you believe that the data is, is among the most valuable assets you have, but all three of you have been criticized as well because they say you're now having a centralized database. You have a centralized database with terabytes and terabytes, massive amounts of, of uh, information. And so the question is, how do we address the critics that it is okay for such a database, centralized database to exist? And, 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 and let's talk a little bit about sort of what, what frameworks we need to have in, a, in place that would ease the fears that the critics and, and the people that imagine that there are things that are happening, we need to make sure that they understand it cannot happen. So let's talk about, about centralized databases and the fears they raise and how do you alleviate these fears. Maybe I can start this time with Dr. Garg. Um, uh, yes, um, so this is uh, no doubt um, an area where there have been a lot of queries, issues and uh, questions. And uh, perhaps uh, biometric information is sensitive. And uh, the, the best way to store it, I would think would be in a very centralized manner uh, where there are appropriate uh, security protocols uh, that are developed and you have multiple firewalls. Uh, 
But apart from uh, the technological aspects of security, I think there are a number of other layers that are required. I mentioned on the statutory part, uh, so that the act, uh, the legislative act, which governs these institutions, uh, takes care of it and have strict protocols of uh, how it can be shared, if at all it can be shared. Uh, and there are very strict protocols. For example, under no circumstances can biometrics go outside our data walls. And we just can't share it. And there are very strict protocols for sharing even the demographic information, the name, etc. Apart from that, uh, we capture minimalistic information, as I mentioned, only five fields of demographic information and without other things like income or, uh, or occupation and things like that. Uh, then uh, the other uh, aspects are having regular and mandatory audits by third parties to ensure that whether the protocols that are supposed to have been set out, whether uh, they, are, they are being done. Uh, to have prohibitive penal provisions in case there's any violation of any of the uh, provisions that are there statutorily by UIDI authority itself or by any of its ecosystem uh, partners. Uh, then providing transparency in terms of the update mechanisms, uh, the usage histories to the residents so that they get the uh, confidence that their data is not being used by anyone else and they have transparency of how their data has been used. And I think that's one very, very important method to build uh, credibility. And last but not the least- How do you give that? Uh, keep, keep going. I'll, I'll ask you about transparency in a second. Yeah. And, and the last but not the least is having a very strong forensic and fraud analytics function within uh, the organization, uh, which acts as a kind of a check on uh, not only the employees, but the ecosystem partners to ensure that there have been no leakages. So I think it's a combination of governance, technology, and processes, uh, which would provide the necessary faith to the system. But when you talk about transparency, does that mean somebody resident in India, uh, when their data is accessed, will they be notified that their data has been accessed? Or will they be able to know? Yes. Anytime there is anyone who seeks yeah. what we call authentication, uh, mm -hmm. uh, SMS goes to that person and an email, uh, depending on, oh, uh, we have the SMS and email link to that. And uh, that is something that goes to them. And secondly, uh, we have the provision that if you go to the portal and uh, you put in your uh, uh, Aadhaar number, and obviously we verify whether it's you are doing it or not, then you can view who all have used your uh, data for what purposes. So if there has been any illegal uh, usage of data, you can highlight it, and we have a very strong grievance mechanism, and you can uh, uh, you can you, you can uh, get redressal through that route. Okay, we're going to come back to this issue after I, I hear from Tariq and from DJ Aziz. Yes, um, all of the above that uh, Doctor Sorab has uh, told you, uh, we have also a centralized database. And you know, there are concerns, You very valid concerns as you mentioned, you know, risk of easy access, security, risk of data loss and all that. But you know, we protect in the same way like uh, most of the uh, you know, identity authorities protect, uh, but we, ha we have also a very minimal you know, information in the citizen database the biometrics are not exposed on the internet, and it is uh, it is uh, it is sort of open platform where you uh, can attach other repositories. Uh, you can stitch those repositories using the CNIC number, and if a government wants to conduct a study uh, based on the data, they can conduct it. But overall, the data is protected, and we deploy it to we uh, employ two approaches, which are privacy by design and security by default. For security, we have uh, sec uh, you know a strategy where all these encryptions and firewalls and uh, security uh, depth uh, in de uh, defense 
uh, strategy DID that we uh, employ. So I think there there are benefits for both uh, you know decentralization and centralization of data, but we have sort of a mixed strategy where the bio biometric data is placed at one place. And when the authentication take place, the result goes back and forth as a yes or no form. We don't share a lot of details in terms of KYC, in terms of other uh, you know, uh, uh, authentication mechanisms. Similarly, we sent the SMS also when you apply for the IDA card or for social protection program or for disaster management program, when your data is used or your consent is taken, whether you, if you are entitled for that service and you allow to uh, your identity to be used. What we are working right now is uh, developing a platform where we will empower the user so that they can actually log in and see who has checked their data and uh, they, they would have the grievance redressal system just like India has as well. Okay, let me ask um, Pakistan and India a pointed question, which is if, if the national police comes and says, I need access to this data, will they get access to this data or is there a procedure that, that really restricts that access by saying, this is not access for the purpose for which we collected the data. So can you describe, perhaps Tariq, you can describe how is access to the data beyond the API would be permitted or not permitted? Well, there is a procedure that if there is a, a person of interest, uh, if um, uh, a crime has been committed, or if a terrorist incident has happened and there is a case for human uh, you know, a, inter a closure maybe that they want to identify the dead bodies or if they want to identify the victim of that, then there is a procedure that they go to the third party. It's called crisis management cell and set up in Ministry of Interior. They make the case and then that third party asks, uh, uh, requests us to release limited amount of data. And then we give to the third party and then they make the, they make the determination, okay, you know, whether to uh, close the case or give that agency that data or not. So we have a control mechanism that you cannot actually come here and uh, uh, get the data of anybody. So there is, a, there is a procedure that the government has established. Okay, Dr. Garg, do you have any, anything to add to that? Because I know oh. UID had something. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, a biometric data is we don't share in any case uh, ever, even if there's any uh, procedures. Where, for demographic, that's the name, date of birth, uh, gender, if there's a particular request, uh, number one, yeah, it can, uh, yeah, it can only be done uh, in, in in certain circumstances. Either there has to be an order of the high court, uh, I mean, a court not below the level of the high court. So only the high court of the state or the Supreme Court can order that in certain cases, uh, which have to be very clearly mentioned in the judicial order, why uh, that demographic information has to be shared. And the other provision is that uh, uh, there's an uh, oversight committee chaired by the cabinet secretary, uh, which can, in certain instances of uh, national security interest, can uh, direct uh, the authority to release uh, demographic uh, uh, data. Uh, and again, there has to be a, a, a set, uh, uh, the reason has to be very clearly stated, and it has the law secretary um, the IT secretaries and others on this committee. And only under these two circumstances, order of the court or order of uh, this oversight committee, and for very limited purposes, can demographic data be given. Biometrics can never be given. Okay. DHS is how do you protect uh, this valuable asset? Um, I know cybersecurity, you can do it, but the question is, what if requests to access the data, how do you deal with them? Yeah, thank you very much. You know, recently we had a case whereby 
it involve our, our senior citizen in far away UK. And uh, there's a lot of uh, glamour that uh, we should provide uh, information to certify the age of the mm. person. So, and uh, there is a pal saying that you cannot shave somebody that is not in front of you. So the idea that uh, all our verification agents and also the data capturing uh, people, they have access to verify the information. But the, but the idea is that the person have to be in front of them that is asking for a service before that is done. And it is being recorded at the, uh, at the back end that we have these, uh, these logs. And also, as my colleagues also says, that to us, you have to, the court also have to even write to the attorney general. It's the attorney general that will ask. And it is the information that is required, like in that case, that they wanted the age of the person. So not all the other information. There is no point any time that you would even require the raw uh, uh, biometrics because if the raw biometrics have been processed to get, get the uh, miniatures and then an, a, a unique ID number has been given. And also, as my colleague says, we also adopted the Indian model whereby we are just capturing just little information. Therefore, uh, more of, we are more of a foundational system. Other agencies capture those transactional information that makes it a, a whole system. So we have a foundational system, the others are functional uh, system, a federated system because we made a system. So the data is limited, it's not the whole data. And there's no way that you can give the, the Listen, and we allow that citizens should give their own consent. And that is why we move to the tokenization platform right now on the mobile phone. The person have to give the consent to will also be, be able to check from the mobile phone who have I given my access, uh, uh, access to the data. And of course, we follow all the uh, standard processes that are, that are being taken and also using the ISOs and standards uh, to, to make sure that we protect the, the, uh, the critical assets. Excellent. So I, I want to move on to the, to, the, to the financial model, the financing of, of identity authorities um, as the final segment. But before I do that, I want to call in for the community voices. If anybody wants to join the illustrious panel, raise your hand and the operator will elevate you. Uh, but also at the same time, very quickly, um, in your estimation, when do you think your country will have um, a data protection law that will impact your operations? Um, maybe Dr. Garg, you can you can answer that question. Then uh, Aziz and then Malik, Dr. Uh, so uh, we already have uh, two legislations in place. One is the Information Technology Act, and uh, there is the Aadhaar Act, uh, which has certain provisions already of data mm -hmm. protection in place. There is a separate data protection bill, uh, which is under preparation. Uh, there was uh, one which had been prepared last year, and then it's earlier this year it was uh, withdrawn, keeping in view the uh, the comments that have been received. And a new bill uh, is now uh, presently in in the works, and it is expected within the next uh, uh, few months, uh, as in uh, when the parliament reconvenes, it would be taking a view on it. So uh, while we already have some uh, elements in place, a uh, independent act uh, would also soon be in place. No, and, and you're ready for it? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, great. Did you have this? Yes, uh, well, I think it's similar. We already have the, the regulations uh, in place. We have also some of the parts of our act too that addresses the data protection. And also on ourselves too, we have developed the, the tokenization platform that enables the the citizen to, to, to give consent and also at the back end also we protect the, the data. And also the new law is also in, in place. And I believe that by December it should be in place. Even this morning I had 
meeting with the with the DG and uh, they are thinking of having a uh, validation uh, of the new bill next week. <laughs> so so there is a lot in place to come up with one holistic law that yep. uh, that take care of everything. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not simple. Even in the US, they've been struggling yeah. to get a holistic law. There's a lot of state level laws that are contradictory, et cetera. So it's very important to be ready for a national law. And it seems that you are both confident in doing that. I, I'd like to hear from uh, Tariq, um, yes. what laws cover you? Uh, yes, uh, our Data Privacy Act is in Ministry of IT and uh, is soon it is going to become a law. They are sending it to Parliament, I think, next month. And uh, it has our input also, and we are ready. But we didn't wait for the country actually to have overall bill. NADRA Act, when we were working on that, it has two sections. Section 28 deals with privacy info, and it stipulates information not to be diverged and if diverged by Nadra employees or anybody using our data shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to five years or with fine which has some you know I think one million rupees or both and the section 29 is regarding security secrecy of data not to be breached and so again, penalties and punishment are uh, stipulated in that. So while we can say that Data Privacy Act is in works, but the operative law, uh, that is NADRA Act, these two sections are still operative. Okay, thank you. This is great. Okay, so basically to summarize, um, there are bits and pieces of, of regulations and, and, and laws that govern the, the way you're treating the data, but you are doing um, more than what these laws are asking for in anticipation of national uh, omnibus uh, laws that cover extensively all types of data and specifically sensitive data, which we expect biometrics to be considered as sensitive data by almost universally all laws. <laughs> okay, so now, I come to the heart of this discussion, which is clearly you are organizations that have well-defined institutional infrastructure, institutional arrangements. You have incredibly valuable assets. Um, and so I'd like to try to understand um, how do you plan for financial sustainability? Um, clearly, most if I were a CEO of a company and I have an asset, I'll try to find a way to monetize that asset in a way that allowed by the law responsibly. And so I'd like to talk about, um, and, and we can start with NIMSI. How do you think identity authorities should be financed, should be funded, and what should they be allowed to do to um, achieve financial and operational sustainability? Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the Currently, we have been financed 100% uh, by the government, and whatever we get also goes to the government. But uh, as you said, in this 21st century, everyone requires a business model, and a business model defines the, the offering, what is being offered, and how it is going to be monetized, and also how it's going to be sustained. So these tripods have to be uh, put in place. So in our own uh, focus has been to, to maximize the automation and lean cost structure, outsourcing of the non-core uh, functions and the strategic partnership to improve performance and efficient service de delivery. And the target is to increase identity service availability. And anytime that we had issue, it has to be that this availability availability, accessibility, convenience, and also usage. So for sustainability, we NIMSI have been charging fees for some of the ID services. We allow that citizens first contact with government services is always free of charge. It is when you come back for like data update or modification, then we charge something uh, just little to, for the cost of uh, what is happening or 
mean sleep reprint or authentication and verification services or even premium enrollments like outside the country. So we have also employed dynamic pricing structure for these ID services ranging from negotiated uh, rates, uh, volume dependent rates, per transaction fees or subscription fees. So we don't have one particular model that captures uh, everything. So it depends on the use cases. And many, many use cases are, are, are coming up and we, we intend to, to capture them the way they come. But uh, DJ Aziz, from your perspective, um, obviously um, there, there is, we can amortize the cost of building your infrastructure, amortize the cost of building the database. So we don't need to put that into, into your, your budget. Let's say that was invested. But beyond that point in time, do you think identity service authentication will give you 100% of your operating budget, 50% of your operating budget? Where would your vision put the revenue relative to the sustainability operating cost? Thank you very much. Well, from our experience in the past six years that we started, we started by offering the free service, uh, like to the banks and any other person that wants to, uh, wants to authenticate, because you know, when you are introducing something really new in this digital era, you have to provide them for the test of that service. So, and so far from verification services alone, I don't think that is going to sustain the organization because what we have seen is, uh, is just a, 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 even to sustain the services, not to talk of the, uh, the organization that we have, or even the infrastructure itself, I don't think so for now. But uh, in future, and also being uh, a global village, that uh, because we 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 have seen some uh, external bodies to trying to uh, check the services through some of our agents, and and they have not been paying the right fees. Uh, so when we find ways to check those things, so probably the service will will improve, but but not yet. Okay. Tarek, um, you, you have a different kind of organizational model. So could you share with us um, how are you financed and what is your sort of revenue sustainability? Yes, we have, um, we, um, we don't get any money from the government other than the projects that we do for the government. So okay. there is zero rupee or dollar value attached in government budget for NARA. So how we do it is quite interesting. Uh, we charge for the projects that we do nationally and internationally in South-South cooperation. And uh, uh, we charge for the products uh, like the applications and the system and the platform we develop for, uh, for, uh, for the ministries, department agencies. And uh, the government actually sets the fees for the uh, various products like ID card, ID card for overseas Pakistanis, uh, family registration certificate, so on and so forth, all ID documents. But those documents are very much subsidized. Nadra does not charge, just like Nigeria, does not charge any uh, fee uh, for first ID card. So first ID card is free of cost. Uh, but, you know, it has been a challenge, but we are challenging ourselves, you know, to maintain 776 registration offices, 222 mobile vans, and some biker service and man pack units and infrastructure and upgrading the technology cost. But it is, uh, a, it is a tough journey, but we, it is very much sustainable in a way that our business model is set up so that we charge P for the service that we provide uh, in terms of digitization. But the public generally gets very subsidized and cheap fees. Uh, it depends that if you want 
for example, an ID card in 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 few days, then you have to pay more. Otherwise, you know, you have a subsidized service. Similarly, if a service that you require very urgently, you pay more. But mainly, we offset these all these amounts by international uh, projects. Okay, so you you believe um, that this, if you look at it as a business, an identity yes. authority can at very least break even by adopting um, a model with a portfolio of services and verification services plus products that you are issuing to the public, even if they are subsidized. You believe at the very least you can you can arrive at at, um, yes. at breaking even. You're, uh, you're an example. Is- yeah, it depends on the country. It's a large country, you know, right. uh, sixth largest country in the world. So it, uh, you know, I mean, we have uh, uh, we have forged partnership with the private sector also. For example, right. banks, insurance companies, microfram, finance institution, credit lending uh, institution, health insurance companies. So yes. if they do KYC, you charge even a minimal fee. Uh, I think uh, we we are sort of cheapest. It depends if you measure in dollar. You know, the uh, Pakistan is the cheapest Pakistan rupee uh, fee that we charge, okay. and uh, so. But the volume is so large that it caters for the infrastructure as uh, as well. Similarly, if you are rolling some innovative products where you are creating an incentive regime for the population to actually use that uh, product, it helps in the end to take your identity assurance level high. The more transaction that Tariq would have on uh, his I- digital ID, there is a more identity assurance level and you say, no, his identity is assured. And mm-hmm. so, you know, it helps in both way in making sure that the data quality of your uh, the quality of your data is enhanced also and improved Excellent. and accuracy dr garb give us your perspective on business models for identity authorities you're the largest in the world you have the biggest data you can monetize it the best uh, what what is the universe of possibilities uh, um, yes so um, I think I'll just go what we are doing and then maybe talk of the possibilities. Mm. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we consider digital identity as a public good, a public infrastructure. And with that thought in mind, uh, the, uh, the, the infrastructure, we get substantial support, budgetary support from the government. And uh, we believe that digital identity uh, helps in what our Honorable Prime Minister calls the ease of living of residents. And the objective of the digital identity is to empower the most vulnerable and the most weakest person and the ability for them to be able to say who they are, who am I, that in itself uh, provides uh, the kind of empowerment and support to the economy which nothing else can. And we have documented that uh, the kind of expenditure that we have incurred over the past 10 years, the benefits that have accrued to the government are around 10 times of that in terms of uh, deduplication, that is removal of people getting welfare benefits twice uh, because of lack of digital identity and the removal of ghost beneficiaries and the savings that the government has done, both the central government and the state governments are 10 times the very, very conservative figure that I'm saying of the cost that we have incurred. So we have no plans at all to make uh, UIDI uh, charge for its services or make itself financially independent. Having said that, we do charge nominally for updates so that it doesn't become like a free lunch, then people will keep updating. We do charge uh, private sector usage so that uh, people are aware of uh, what they're doing. We don't charge for the government services. So there is a differential pricing, uh, but that in no way will meet the operational costs, which 
are very clearly a public infrastructure. Yeah, actually, all, all three of you have really given tremendous insights about how the financing of, of identity authorities should be, should, be, um, should be done. But one clear thing that's going to become even clearer over time as the economists start to quantify the economic impact of identity on government business and the return on investment on the government suggests a very clear model um, with, which, which should be essentially like a universal access fund, which uh, obligates from the budget of all the other sectors to say, this is shared infrastructure, you're using it, you're needing it for your work, you're, you're generating X amounts of, of, uh, of um, uh, savings from your business model. Therefore, you must contribute to the maintenance and enhancing the quality of the data, maintaining it secure so there'll be no breaches, et cetera. Uh-huh. This is very important um, to maintain the responsibility because if we believe that identity has an ROI, then the government needs to put some of that ROI back into sustaining the identity ecosystem and promoting it. Um, In the past, this wasn't clear because people said, well, we don't know how much the identity is saving us and all this stuff. But we as a community and you as leaders and the development agencies working with us all, we need to be pushing for what we call the ROI dividend. The ROI dividend needs to come back to the identity authorities um, because you are in a sustainable place. So I see the startups phase, yes, we need seed money. We need some loans, seed money to get people up and and going. But once you've started at a point where 60, 70, 80% of the population is enrolled and you're starting to develop an ROI, there needs to be an ROI dividend that sustains you and makes you grow and not be uh, subject to the vagaries. And so it is very important for all organizations that are thinking of setting up identity authorities not to ignore the need to establish a sustainable funding mechanism that goes beyond the initial loan or the initial seed money. And and these three examples that we've heard about, um, in in addition, of course, there's nothing wrong with being creative and and starting to offer products and innovations, et cetera. There is value for that. Nadra has demonstrated that. Not one model would fit everybody. Um, I I believe we need a, need a, a, a collection of things. We need a collection of an ROI dividend. We need some transactional uh, value so that, uh, especially the private sector, should not take this for granted, and the and the individual public should not just do whatever they want every time they feel like it. They need to know there's some some value uh, uh, attached to that. Plus, your experience as IT and your experience as as owners of data and, and custodians of data should be something that you can monetize. So, I hope um, th- this discussion should have inspired. Um, the our audience that has been really looking to understand the options. I want to thank the three of you for a wonderful conversation. I've known you for all of you for a while. You're all dear friends, but I think you really have come come through with your generous sharing of information. Unfortunately, we ran out of time for this segment, but I am certain we are going to have you come back again, addressing different aspects as as we continue this journey together. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. We're going to continue um, and start with the segment three. Operator, please uh, prepare the segment. Uh, this is going to be Eye on Ethiopia. Our, our, um, in our continuing Eye on Africa series today, we're going to present Eye on Ethiopia. Ethiopia is among the latest entrants into the digital identity world. Uh, but they're advancing rapidly in planning and preparation for this uh, major initiative. Uh, We are very pleased to have with us actually the team that is making the progress on the ground to give us a sneak peek into the working process, share lessons learned and unveil their vision going forward. I want to emphasize what makes this even more fascinating is the fact that we will be talking about work in progress, something we do not get the opportunity to do that often. So um, welcome, Yodehi and the project team. Uh, You you are in the process of developing a large scale ID project pretty much from scratch. Um, Can you kick off this segment by telling our audience what is this project about? 
Um, thank you so much, Dr. Joseph. Um, as you have uh, aptly introduced us at the beginning, uh, we can be considered one of the youngest um, national ID programs in Africa. We, uh, we have not yet celebrated our second birthday. Um, the pilot project has been launched uh, uh, as of uh, 2000, mid-2021, and we've completed uh, the pilot project uh, last June. Uh, since then, we're uh, preparing and taking the first steps to make uh, a full launch, a full country rollout. We are uh, making sure the foundation is ready for a country rollout. The name of our project is, um, we call the project in our local language, FIDA. Uh, it's legally known as the Ethiopian Digital Identification uh, Program uh, or National ID Program. We use both digital and national interchangeably. Um, it's relatively greenfield. There is no other national level ID program in Ethiopia, even though we have other national identification documents, paper-based or uh, more conventional legacy documents, we call Kabali ID. Um, this project has officially been approved by the Council of Ministers as a, as a legal entity, so that the identification we provide, the digital identification we provide, can be considered as a legal ID. Um, it was approved a uh, few months ago, last uh, June. Uh, currently, it resides under the Prime Minister's office. We report uh, to the office of the Prime Minister and we exist as a project, not as a permanent authority. Um, but with regards to, this is a governance from the legal perspective, but where does uh, our production systems reside? How do we manage all of that? We, we use uh, government's provided data centers to host our services as of now, uh, even though we are thinking of various and hybrid options going into the future. Thank you. So, so Yodahe, is this FIDA platform or FIDA identity, is this a legal identity or is it, a, is it a, an economic identity or a digital economic identity? We, we consider it to be both. Uh, the United Nations defines legal identity as it closely relates to a civil registration, as in uh, identity from birth, but it can also, according to the United Nations, they also define it as an identification provided by an ID authority. Hence, um, our ID is basically contains foundational basic personal attributes, name, gender, date of birth, um, and current address in addition to biometrics. So it can be defined both as a legal identity uh, as well as economic identity uh, econo for uh, an identification used for economic transformation because it's mainly targeted towards service provision. And um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about what is driving this project. I mean, I assume um, there are functional ID systems in the country. Maybe we can talk a little bit about them. What's, uh, what's deficient about them and why do you need to go and reform by creating a brand new ID project? Um, so the why is a very crucial and critical question. Uh, most of our uh, development targets as a nation, as government, um, rely on digital transformation and digital economy, it's impossible to uh, achieve some of these sustainable development goals without um, digital transformation. Also for some of these sustainable development goals, identification at the individual level is important. Identity is a right. Uh, it uh, will allow you to get services, uh, financial inclusion, access to credit, access to social services, et cetera. So the why is more from the perspective of the resident than from the government wanting to collect data, but it's more from the perspective of the resident so that the resident can uh, receive service as they should. So the rationale is more towards uh, service delivery, increase, increasing efficiency um, and the like. Maybe, maybe you can bring in some of your team on talking about priority services. So what kind of priority services would you think um, this program needs to be um, empowering? Um, so 
perhaps Heno can start by describing a little bit about uh, the priority sectors we've been dealing with so far yeah. in our pilot as well as in the current phase. Heno, unmute, please. I think maybe we have uh, frozen the screen. Uh, no, the screen is frozen. Okay, we'll try to have Hena uh, reconnect. Yes, try to reconnect. In the meantime, maybe, maybe we can move on to another priority um, to try to understand, uh, especially... Well, Miriam, you can come in about, uh, uh, yeah, from your perspective, priority sectors. Thank you. And thank you very much for having me on this panel. Uh, it was very informative to, to hear uh, the previous um, speakers. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atik, to, uh, to, for organizing this. Uh, so, yeah, the role of uh, the digital ID uh, within the context of the vision of our digital transformation roadmap is very important. Um, Ethiopia recognizes the transformational impact that the fourth industrial revolution can have on countries' development. So we very rapidly responded to the need of uh, progressing towards a uh, digital economy, as, as, as Yoday was, was mentioning. And that meant really having an inclusive uh, digital transformation strategy. And that's how uh, Digital Ethiopia was adopted by the Council of Ministers. It's been two years uh, now. Um, the vision uh, is really to innovate, create, and adopt new and, and future technologies to um, allow uh, inclusive interactions between citizens. And we've identified the, the, the building blocks of our strategy. And the first building, building block was the establishment of the National Digital ID, uh, designed as, as uh, you know, as a foundational system that would serve all sectors and, and uh, and be a, an essential function um, of proving uh, the identity of, of our citizens, of our residents. The second was the interoperable payment systems. Uh, so really banking the unbanked. Uh, Ethiopia has a very, uh, uh, still a very low uh, financial inclusion um, rate. We are currently around 45%. So um it, it was really uh, it is uh, it is a, a focus to make sure uh, that we have uh, payment systems in place and that we are able to bank the unbanked e-government applications so e-services portal and creating an enabling ecosystem for e-commerce platforms so all of them have as a unifying factor uh, the digital identity and specifically in the electronic environment, because we believe um, it will facilitate uh, communication and collaboration between uh, what uh, what is today very siloed uh, organizational or ministries. And we think also it will further heighten security. So as you have heard uh, around FIDA, uh, uh, it's not a number that provides rights or benefit, uh, but different ministries and businesses or agencies can use it, um, uh, can use a number by linking their services to the database. And um, this means that uh, it is designed to support multiple services, whereby it is used by all services, uh, all, all service rendering entities. Actually, uh, when I first heard the name FIDA, I thought it was brilliant. So could you please explain to our audience, what does FIDA mean? It's not called the national ID number, it is called the FIDA number. So what is FIDA? Uh, what I left you, Dave. Yeah, so some of uh, our speakers maybe uh, may know Swahili. They would know what the meaning of FIDA is, uh, or Arabic as well. So it's a very common word among many languages, including a lot of Ethiopian languages, and uh, that the meaning is value. Mm. FIDA means value, so FIDA number is like value number. Mm. And basically, it gives the citizen immediately, the, the resident or the citizen the impression immediately what this is about. This is about bringing me my value, the value of my identity, empowering my identity through this value. Uh, so is this an official name uh, in the act itself? So in, in the act, it's referred to as uh, Ethiopian digital identification. 
uh, or uh, the, the number, it's called uh, uh, the unique identification number. So it's not coded in the act, but uh, it's a name that we plan to adopt for uh, uh, okay. yeah, awareness. And uh, yeah, on the day to day, we want the bank teller to say, uh, you give me your FIDA number, etc. Yeah, I mean, this is like Adhar. Adhar is infrastructure. FIDA is, so I, I think we should be collecting the different names that identity numbers are now accumulating around the world um, with each with its own local uh, meaning, which is wonderful. So that's the sidebar because I'm sure our audience would find it as interesting as I found it. Um, and thank you for, for that explanation. So, um, Yorehe, maybe you can um, answer this question or direct it to somebody on, on your team. What I want to understand, I mean, surely the, the, the country, Ethiopia, uh, ha already has several ID systems, maybe mostly um, uh, uh, functional ID systems. And so how do Ethiopians identify themselves today? And how does the FIDA in the future integrate with these other systems, replace them, integrate with them, seed them, link to them? I mean, what, what is the vision um, that, that you guys can explain to us the role of FIDA in the Ethiopian current and future ID ecosystem? Um, let me let Henok explain a little bit about the legacy and the most prevalent type of identification that we have now on ground called uh, Cavalier ID. Henok. Yes, uh, thank you, Yudahe. Thank you, Dr. Atik. It's good to join you back again. Uh, I apologize for the uh, connection issues. Surely there are uh, identification systems in Ethiopia. So identity, identity or identification in Ethiopia is somehow a complex issue so far. Uh, so people sometimes do not necessarily associate with the unique attributes of a, a person which are used to identify a person uniquely. But uh, we believe the introduction of FIDA now will decouple those additional ones or layers from the basic identification features where we, we think to, uh, we plan to identify people by those unique uh, attributes that they have. So Ethiopia, as you know, is a federal country and there are federal and regional government uh, structures. So uh, following that, there is a decentralized approach uh, which gives uh, an, an autonomous uh, power to the region. So following that, there are some differences between the regions in the implementation of identification uh, so far. Uh, FIDA will be implemented at the federal level. So we expect to have a similar implementation throughout the country. So the main uh, identification system, be it at federal level in Addis Ababa or regional uh, regions and uh, cities administrations, it is the Kavale ID as uh, Mr. Yudahi has mentioned earlier. The Kavale ID is uh, primarily a, is a functional ID that uh, is used for the purpose of proving residence but because of uh, the lack of uh, foundational, other foundational ID systems, the Kavale uh, ID was pretty much used as that single one document that has been used across the board. So other documentations uh, do also exist in Ethiopia, so, such as birth certificates, driving license passport, passports, and all of these have uh, their issues, uh, limitnesses in terms of accessibility and use. So uh, the, Kabale system is basically a paper-based system that is that is done or given at local level using at, at the uh, smallest administration unit that is called Kabale. So there is an issue of accessibility and fraud and problem of uh, automatic traceability associated with Kabale IDs because it's not centralized or it is not connected to a, a database. Uh, you, we can also take other legacy systems that is, such as the tax ID system. We, we call it tax identification number or TIN number. So this one uh, has more identification features uh, uh, compared to the Kavale ID, uh, such as fingerprints along with photo. But the issue with the TIN number is also, it is not complete. The fingerprint is sometimes not complete. And uh, there is a possibility of uh, having TIN numbers at different uh, locations or for different business categories. So it's not, it's not basically a unique identifier so far. Also, uh, only close to 7 million people have been issued with this 
thin number so far. Uh, we have conventional KYC system that is uh, still uh, mostly for the most part paper based, where you take your they take your ID card and keep a photocopy of it, and if uh, for some high level transactions, including high level financial transactions, if authentication is needed, that is mostly done manually. And that means it takes a, a number of days. Uh, there are also, I would like to acknowledge that there are recent attempts to improve on that. Um, the other is additional documents are sometimes required uh, if you want to get uh, a certain service from the uh, government office or other actors. So additional documents are required. So uh, these are the limitations of the existing system that we have in Ethiopia. Thank you. What about birth registration? Where, where, do, where does Ethiopia stand on this issue? Um, so let me yeah. chime in on this one. Birth registration, uh, every regional government maintains its own vital statistics and civil registration. That includes resident ID, births, uh, the usual uh, vital, uh, vital and uh, civil registration. Um, hence, the birth registration uh, is at a very low adoption rate, both in urban and rural settings. And we hope looking forward, we've had discussions with uh, Ethiopian Migration and uh, Civil uh, Registration Service. So looking forward, the data, the biometric-based unique ID, uh, the FIDA ID we provide can be leveraged to issue uh, more civil registration documents such as births uh, and marriage, et cetera. Okay, so um, fair to say that, you know, the, the demand for the FIDA the ID system is basically modernizing, reforming, and creating a more um, a flexible and, and, and a more inclusive and an ID system that can be um, more suitable for service delivery because it can exist in, in, a, in a digital format. It can support um, biometric authentication and therefore identity service uh, verification would, would be available in support of services. So in a way, th there is nothing special about the needs of Ethiopia that drove this. W what makes FIDA sort of Ethiopian per se? Is there, is there anything beyond what we've heard from other countries that, that need, that motivate the need for an ID system? Uh, perhaps let me open this one, this question to Al. Um, as he has been uh, very close with the project since uh, its inception, and maybe you can uh, you can uh, uh, pro you can uh, share a few points. What makes uh, the our ID program stand out? Sure, I I'd love to, and uh, yeah, thank you everybody and uh, Dr. Art for the invitation. So uh, from the very get go, uh, it, it was a very um, in, uh, Clear move by 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 the government to make sure that that was going to be done could be different aspects uh, of the work, uh, starting with the system. Um, the former representation, the minister from uh, Togo, talked about MOSIP. So Ethiopia has one of the very early adopters of the. MOSIP. Al, we're, we're losing you. Your connection in, uh, comes in. Yes. Uh, okay, great. So, um, so, so thanks everybody for the uh, for the presentation so far. Uh, very happy to be here. So, from the very beginning, I, I think this uh, work was is key for a number of sectors uh, in Ethiopia. Um, as my co-panelist um, uh, Miriam mentioned earlier, with the digital Ethiopia concept. There were two uh, pillars that was mentioned there. So one was the uh, digital ID, and then secondly was the uh, financial system. So we collectively call these the digital public infrastructure. But for that to happen, we felt that it was important that the government and the Ethiopian population can own the project and own the system. And by ownership, we mean to have an ability not just to adopt, if we adopt various strong systems from all over the world, but the idea, a minimum we assume should be, uh, is that where we can may at least maintain the system locally and be able to operate them locally. So the, a key decision was made early on to make sure that whatever was selected uh, met these two requirements. So 
Um, I'm proud to say that uh, Ethiopia was one of the early adopters of MOSIP. In fact, mm -hmm. even before uh, the pilot that we'll be hearing uh, shortly, uh, we've been able to identify uh, key developers and strong uh, project management team that can maintain and um, build on the MOSIP operating system. But we're extending that not just on the software side, but from the implementation uh, aspect as well. So, you know, in a project, you know, it's not the system or the product that make it work, but it's actually the overall project management, uh, the leadership and the structure and so on. So from that sense, the belief in, in this, the, the principle has been uh, locally owned, locally maintained and operated, but at the same time also to be able to contribute to the global community. So we take that, but we'll be able to uh, make sure that we can meet the demands of the country locally, but also expand it throughout the globe. Okay. Actually, that, that's a good good way of looking at it. I mean, you basically wanted to make sure that you are able to support every aspect of this project, including helping yourself to make any changes, um, interacting with other other players who might contribute to this ecosystem, etc. So I, I will I will drill down a little bit more about this, but let us um, get into the business of. Um, how do you plan a greenfield project like this? I mean, this did not happen where you guys sat around in a cafe somewhere in Addis Ababa and said, it would be nice to have this. What were the steps that you had to go through in order to see the birth of a project? Uh, what was the planning process? Were there any resistance? How did you overcome it? I mean, tell us a story about how do you go about doing such a thing? So the, the idea for a national ID where there is a, a one database, that's a single source of truth uh, for identification uh, is not very new to Ethiopia. The project has existed in one form or another for uh, well more than a decade. But uh, the philosophy behind it, of course, changed. At first, it was more focused on uh, avoiding identity fraud, uh, catching uh, ghost accounts, et cetera, et cetera. But now it's more focused on uh, you know, the identity fraud cases, the ghost account cases are, they constitute 1%. Now it's focusing more on the 99%. It's about um, increasing efficiency, in, uh, allowing service providers to give value added services, etc. cetera. Uh, but as a Greenfield project, we uh, definitely uh, do face, uh, we are basically uh, disruptors. We are changing how KYC is done, how uh, ID identity verification is done, etc. In basically all sectors, that's what that's our aim and that's our vision. And so uh, we, even in the pilot, we face challenges and we expect to face more challenges as we go into the national rollout. Yeah, actually, it's it's quite interesting to listen to you talk about the changing perspective, how important it is. I mean. 15 years ago, identity was motivated by security, national security. Then it was motivated by combating crime and fraud and stopping fraud from, from, from happening. Now we're talking about identity being a pillar in digital transformation and empowering people. It is the heart of the ID for D agenda, which is we're not really talking about the 1% fraud cases. We can make those part of the cost of doing business. But what we're talking about is dramatically game-changing how people interact and how economies are, are, are built and, and sustained and made to grow. So this is an important way to approach your project. So if you're trying to build a project, I think it's important to assess and understand its role in the economic and social development of the country. So wonderful. So you went through that step. What else can you tell us? What happened? Uh, how did you identify the stakeholders? Did you bring them in a room? Did you invite them? Did you build bridges? Can you talk about stakeholder development? Um, perhaps I, uh, I can start with a few examples and my colleagues can also add some of the very ripe or low hanging fruits as use cases. Ministry of Transport uh, is a good example. Uh, the Ethiopian Ministry of Transport was is still in the process of rolling out a new smart transportation system, smart driver's license, smart vehicle ownership certificate, etc. Um, so one of the requirements is to make sure that the driver is unique, uh, the vehicle owner as an individual is unique. Um, so every project in the past had gone about uh, building their own KYC and ID ecosystem. 
A good example in Ethiopia is the Ethiopian Ministry of Revenues, uh, where they deployed a biometric uh, system to identify taxpayers. We call it the TIN number. So now we go about uh, pitching to different ministries, to different national projects, regional projects, even private se sector services, including private banks, saying that you do not need to build an independent ID ecosystem. Maintaining it is difficult, it's costly. Also, you, uh, it's not cross-sectoral. If uh, there is a farming project, it's not, uh, they do not know if it's the same farmer that's borrowing money with the banks and if it's the same person going, seeking social services or health services, et cetera. So that's the value proposition we provide. And so far we've been very successful um, in working with a lot of national projects and in garnering their support uh, in working together. I'll, I'll open the floor to my colleagues. And I can pick up from uh, your diet a little bit. So uh, I want to come up with, I want to think of two words that was mentioned earlier, silos and ecosystems. So as a foundational system with uh, digital ID, we're talking about basically this, a foundation of foundational systems. In many cases, a lot of the information systems that was developed in Ethiopia, and Ethiopia has really done great strides in building uh, information systems across the sectors. So health, you mentioned transportation, we mentioned finances. However, the limitation has been that from the ability from these sectors to talk to each other. And what was missing in the middle is this underlining uh, rail that uh, I'm going to pick up from our uh, former speaker from India mentioned. So what digital ID basically provides us are two components of this. One is the is the registries. So by registries, we're basically talking about the individual, but it could be registries from say professional health uh, workers that we can tie to uh, health facilities, or we can think of registries in terms of uh, students or teachers. And to be able to link that to, that to the other uh, infrastructure that um, was mentioned earlier with finance and to be able to really empower these uh, siloed sectors into providing better enhanced optimized services. So I really wanna to touch on the fact that we're looking at ID um, more from the as a value add for the citizen to be able to uh, get them services faster and not to get into or waste a lot of energy in trying to prove who they are, right? So we come from the principle that ID is a right. As a result, you know, helping build these infrastructures since block these um, these foundations that allow it. So your dimension uh, transportation uh, for insurance, I can highlight um, for health. I can highlight insurance, health professionals, even supply chain. We can provide a lot more efficiency in supply chain infrastructure, without which uh, it's going to be very difficult to help the information system of the country. With uh, PNSMP, some of my colleagues may talk a lot about that. With taxation, I was already mentioned earlier, uh, pension programs, education, and so on. And other colleagues can take on. Actually, uh, in, in following up, maybe you can direct the, us in, a, in the direction of the principles, because um, Al mentioned an interesting principle. You started with the principle ID is a right. Um, what other principles have guided your team's sort of collaboration together and your interface with the other stakeholders. Okay, I, I think Miriam was about to add one point on the use cases, but before perhaps Balaihun, you can talk a little bit about the principles uh, from the legal, uh, from our uh, proclamation perspective, as well as what makes the Ethiopian ID law stand out. I'm sure there is a lot of similarities with other national ID uh, proclamations right. and acts. So what are your guiding principles? Shall I continue? Yes, Belayun, please. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. So, uh, there are uh, different principles in, indicated in uh, our pro proclamation, and there are also uh, different points that stand out of proclamation from other countries because this proclamation we have since since this, since this proclamation is uh, the one who is going to be approved lately. We got an opportunity to include points which uh, uh, other countries' proclamations lack. So 
the, the some principles indicated in the proclamations are that uh, the digital identification system uh, it should be organized in a way to be inclusive, free from discrimination, accessible, and with minimal barriers to entry and use. There are also other different principles. Uh, there are uh, points that uh, stand out of proclamation from other countries, like data minimization. Uh, we have tried to, to, to minimize the kind of information which are going to be collected just to have a, a unique ID number. We only require, actually we collect uh, biometric and uh, biometric information and other demogra demographic concerning demographic information only for uh, major inform informations are collected. Access control, uh, we have tried to, 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 to protect information collected from the institution and from other institutions empowered by this institution. And there are only two exceptions just to, 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 to access those informations. One, when there is a law that empowers other institutions to access those information. And the second exception is only through the order of a court. Unless those two uh, requirements are fulfilled, no one can access information collected, information of individuals collected for the purpose of uh, having unique number. Inclusions, we have tried to, to be very careful not to uh, exclude uh, people from, from, from getting different services because of uh, not having a unique number or FIDA number, as it was called by His Excellency Yodai. Uh, so we have tried to, 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 to put different alternatives if people have not uh, this ID, ID number or a unique number. And we have tried to make uh, the process very easy just to get uh, this uh, uh, unique uh, number. There, we have also tried to see experience of other countries concerning other exclusions because in, in some different countries, uh, the, the law require uh, different, uh, having different informations just to get this unique number like uh, having a birth certificate or uh, didn't to put any, any, any exceptions if people don't have fingerprint because of different reasons like uh, disability or uh, you know because of age. So I have tried to, to be very careful just uh, to avoid this kind of problem. The cost, concerning cost, we have tried to make it uh, you know, a kind of uh, service which can be uh, accessed without any cost actually. Uh, concerning the purpose of the ID, uh, we have tried to, to, to put what actually is the uh, ID going to serve? Just uh, as, he, as it was uh, mentioned, we are, we are trying to make this foundational ID, which can give you know different services, which is going to uh, replace the the, the, the the very backward early ID system. Uh, redressal mechanisms, uh, we have. Uh, try to, to one just to make it very modern uh, kind of law just to make anyone uh, just to, to let anyone to have an access to co complain to the institution and even uh, with other laws like the civil code of Ethiopia anyone who have uh, any complaint damage or like that he, he can uh, bring the cases to the courts and uh, concerning accessibility of the law we have tried to see experience of other countries that uh, some laws drafted prepared by lo local language and it's very difficult to, to, to international community to access that law. And we have also seen other countries experience to the reverse. Some countries law prepared in, in, in only in uh, international language in English and local community cannot have an access to that law. But for our purpose where we just prepare the, the law in the local language Amharic and in international uh, language English. Uh, just to be clear, can you clarify w w uh, w what's the status of the legal 
legislation, the enabling environment, the data protect protection proclamation, where are we in the legal landscape? And then we'll go back to Miriam. Yeah, thank you very much. So the Ethiopian legislative drafting system, it is a, a kind of decentralized legislative drafting system because every governmental institutions can prepare a draft law and present or submit to the Council of Ministers for approval and sending to the House of People representative for, for final approval. In Ethiopia, there are about you know, 100, uh, almost 115 institutions and every governmental institution submits their draft to the Council of Ministers, but the Prime Minister and the Council of Ministers prioritize this digital ID law. They select as one of the, the prioritized law and present submit to the, to the you know, for, for Council of Ministers agenda. So this law is already approved by the Council of Ministers and now it's already in the process of sending to the, to the House of People representative because uh, still now, uh, even though the draft uh, has already approved before almost one, one month, but the Council of Ministers, the Prime Minister of didn't send that law because uh, the House of People representatives, they are not in working session currently. They will okay. come back. Uh, within the next uh, months, and it is it is proposed to be one of their uh, first agenda when they start okay. the uh, and, session. And the national and does that law, does that include uh, data protection proclamation? No, it is already submitted to the Council of Ministers, and uh, okay. there are different... so it's coming after it. Yes, the data but... protection proclamation is submitted to the Council of Ministers, and after that, it will go to the the Parliament. To, to, to be voted on, okay? Yeah, so was, give us an idea about timelines so that quickly, because we're running out of time. I wanna go back to Miriam and then I wanna address a couple of very important questions. So let's speed up a little bit, please. Thank you very much. So the, 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 the personal data proclamation, the people at Council of Ministers or at Prime Minister Office told us that this is going to be one of the priority of the Council of Ministers. So we hope it will, it will be uh, approved by the Council of Ministers within the next uh, either days or within the next month, and we'll okay. receive the House of People representative. Concerning uh, the digital ID law, actually, uh, after it is already submitted to the House of People representative, the people from Council of Ministers they will send this law within the next two or three days. And the, at once it is delivered at the House of People representative, that will be led by the agent of the House. but. According to the working, their working procedure regulation, regulation number six, they have only 21 days to approve. That approve law and, okay. Uh, yeah. okay, so very, very soon. Mary, did you want to add anything to the discussion so far, or do I move on? Yeah, I just wanted to add on the uh, on the stakeholder and maybe relating it to the principles as well. I, I touched upon interoperability earlier. Uh, which is quite important because uh, you know we, we want to achieve interoperability and have uh, the ability to have interfaces. Uh, another another very important uh, one was inclusion, and that touches upon maybe the stakeholders, which is how do we actually achieve enrollment as fast as possible uh, to make sure that all the barriers um, to to uh, to access um, identi ident identification is removed. Uh, so in terms of stakeholders, I think uh, people that already have large databases and the low, low hanging fruits like, you know, the tax identification systems and so on to be prioritized. Um, so, yeah, making sure that inclusion and social programs are, are, are included okay. and, and prioritized as it is in the principles. Uh, so okay. leveraging existing systems and so on. So, yeah, I just wanted okay. to. Add. No, this is this is good. Um, so I want to I want to sort of do an exchange with you, Yodehi, you can switch it to your team if you want, but I want to short answers to a couple of um, questions. Um, the first thing is, um, it, you've stated that you, you wanted sovereignty from the start uh, in the development of this, this project, um, and therefore you built it on, on um, open source. Uh, so my question for you is, how are you building capacity in order for you to be able to um, in, ingest the open source and, and be able to integrate it with the interfaces that you need and interoperability that Miriam was talking about? Um, so sovereignty from the start, it's uh, very crucial 
uh, we've been, uh, as latecomers, we've been able to learn from a lot of other national ID rollouts. Uh, India is a good example, Philippines, Nigeria, Rwanda, Morocco, uh, you name it. So we've, uh, we've been uh, lucky enough to benchmark uh, sovereignty by design, sovereignty from the start, uh, et cetera. So uh, learning, taking the learnings from all of that, we've, uh, we've been able to design a project uh, so that we avoid uh, the, the pitfalls of uh, uh, government-led, uh, state-driven project where it's not citizen-centered, where the data and the control, the user control is not in the hands of the resident, et cetera. So uh, that was, uh, I'm not sure if I've addressed your question. No, the, the question the question is, I mean, you need capacity, you need technical skills, you need people that can do this. Did you go out and to the universities, to the private sector, did you recruit? How, how do you're building capacity to deal with the development of the project? Because you're doing a lot in-house. Correct, yeah. So the funny thing is, for instance, the first time we, the team, the engineering team decided to uh, check MOSIP and what it looks like. We, the MOSIP team did not know about it. We just downloaded it from the internet and started uh, tinkering with it. Uh, it's after a while that we signed an MOU and you know, made it formal. So uh, there is obviously a very, uh, a very thin line where we have to balance technology ownership with key uh, deliverables, with KPIs. Uh, ownership of digital ID, rollout of digital ID is more important than technology ownership. Even though technology ownership is also important, there, is, there has to be, uh, we, we have to uh, trade a very thin line in making sure that we're able to meet our national targets. Um, we, we want to issue seven, at least 70 million digital IDs by 2025, and that's our utmost priority. But while we're doing it, we want to make sure that we're not uh, building a black box where uh, you know we don't understand what's inside. We're just counting the number of digital IDs issued. So we want to avoid that scenario. So we're trying to balance uh, reliance on um, local knowledge, local, lo local skills, but also making sure we meet our targets. Do you intend to issue any credentials? Yeah, so that's a very good question. As uh, you know, Dr. Joseph, you mentioned we're a young program and uh, there's a lot of work in progress, but as far as the ID law uh, is concerned, the ID law does not mandate credentials as mandatory. So what the ID law defines as ID, as digital ID is basically the number uh, however, mobile ID or uh, basic uh, mm -hmm. cards or plastic cards, etc., are on the table. It's very important, as we've learned from other countries, it's very important to have a physical a version of your digital ID in your pockets, without which there would be less adoption, less uh, trust. And uh, so, uh, of course, in cases of uh, offline connectivity or lack of uh, or low infrastructure, rural areas, Credentials are important. So we're working with our own model of where we distribute basic cards, uh, as well as work with the AAID and the local city governments and the local government to issue credentials. Now, what, in your opinion, would be the opportunities for, let's say, the technology providers and the solution providers to co collaborate with you? What will be the, those opportunities? What's the roadmap? Are you going to issue an RFP? What's going to happen? Yes, so we're working with uh, an international consultant to help us prepare a uh, consultancy firm to help us prepare uh, RFPs. So once those RFPs are ready, RFPs for hardware, for software, they will be, uh, they'll be made public and hopefully within the next few months, we'll be able to go through this process so that we can uh, launch our national rollout early. Okay, now, uh, do you mind explaining how you're financed? So, so far, most of the financing for the past uh, recently completed phase, the pilot phase uh, and the current phase where we call it the pre-launch phase between the pilot and the national rollout. So we're uh, mostly financed through government, but we also get uh, support, recruitment support, procurement support from different international organizations, uh, ID4D, uh, UNICA, uh, BMGF, to name a few. Uh, but looking forward, we've not yet signed 
We've not yet inked a financing agreement with any international organizations yet, but we're uh, we're hopeful that we soon enough will be able to sign. So the pilot is is completed. So could you describe um, what is the pilot uh, phase mean and what lessons maybe we can extract from it? I know perhaps uh, you can tackle this. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dahe. Thank you, Dr. Atik. <clears throat> so the pilot uh, started uh, quite a few months back and it's already concluded a couple of months ago. Uh, so we have achieved uh, a registration of, uh, we're now approaching 1 million registration and that registration is done in different uh, modalities. Uh, we used a use case approach where we tested different use cases and setups. So some of the use cases were in urban and, uh, for instance, educated environments, so just in the banks and so on. Uh, but also, uh, Ethiopia is majority of Ethiopia is in, in a uh, you know in a rural setup. So we selected a specific use case that is called the Productive Safety Net Program. That uh, uh, we obtained quite a lot of uh, learning from that. That will be helpful for the design of the national rollout. So. Uh, now we are uh, on a pre-launch phase, uh, which is the initial stage of the national rollout. And uh, uh, we are procuring more registration kits uh, because we have to achieve targets of 12 million and 70 million uh, respectively in a, at least to the end of 2025. And we are preparing an outsourcing arrangement to help us achieve that. We are also mm -hmm. testing systems for integration. Uh, we have tested integration with uh, a few banks and uh, with a revenue system that was, that was just being explained by you, Dahe, and other colleagues. So we are also developing technical capability of the in-house team uh, uh, so that uh, based on the learning of uh, the, the, the pilots, uh, this learnings uh, focus, I can categorize it into two or three. Uh, the, for the registration part, we have obtained relevant insights on the uh, experience of the people during the registration. That uh, again, helps us de design a better national rollout in terms of registration center setup, facilitation, uh, demographic, and especially biometric data capture, because there are sometimes uh, difficulties in capturing fingerprints or irises and so on. Uh, there's also uh, the, the experience of exception handling uh, for uh, some rare uh, or unique cases uh, that will be uh, address the issues of inclusion and so. Uh, we have also learned that NID cannot accomplish this task alone. So we have to onboard other factors, either through uh, outsourcing or uh, onboarding other relying uh, parties. Uh, as for communication, uh, we need to de define a tailored and clear communication that will give a better awareness and understanding of FIDA because that is important for the adoption of FIDA through the community. Um, we also need to tackle preconceived attitude towards uh, technological solutions, some of which we have shared with your platform in previous sessions. Right. We also need to prove relevance and why people should enroll to uh, ID system or the FIDA system. In that, we are thinking of demonstrating end-to-end -end solutions uh, so that people could see the benefit of uh, the ID system and appreciate its uh, added value and so that uh, more people would decide to come on board. Uh, other issues include, we will introduce pre-registration that will help us uh, increase the registration, uh, reduce the registration time and card printing is also uh, another uh, important lesson that we have learned that helps people to adopt the ID system. And thank you. Let, let me clarify. Um, so far, the pilot has really focused on enrollment um, and onboarding. Have you developed any expertise and experience in building an authentication architecture for service delivery? Uh, so we, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, while benchmarking other countries, our authentication uh, architecture is work in progress, definitely, because we're at a relatively early stage. 
Right. But uh, when we benchmark other countries, there is uh, an intermediary entity between service provider and the idea authority. Some call it a trusted service provider. And there's also other intermediaries with the different roles where they can store personal data subject to uh, legal provisions. Uh, they call them account aggregators uh, because KYC is defined uh, differently uh, if you ask a bank as compared to if you ask a health service provider or the health service provider, the KYC data should contain perhaps the, the, age, the weight of the person or the blood type of the person. But when you go to the bank, they need to know the income level or the credit history, et cetera. So that's, that's all of that is part of KYC. And what we provide is only the, the foundational layer, the basic, uh, the, the very basic layer, and of course, the assurance of uniqueness. So mm -hmm. we're working to include these, the roles or properly define the role of an account aggregator, properly define the role of a TSP, trusted service provider. And uh, we, we have, most of it's uh, pretty much figured out what the authentication architecture should look like. And the next few months, we hope to see uh, some real world applications where we are offering authentication services. Do you, do you, are you planning on making um, social protection or social programs among the, the early priority rollouts that you expect? Are, are you working with any Ministry of Social Affairs uh, to identify programs, for example, helping the poor? Yeah, of course, there is a productive safety net program. Perhaps uh, Miriam can talk more about what the PSNP looks like, but in our pilot, we've, uh, we've worked with a productive safety net program just to register the beneficiaries. So it's mm -hmm. low-income people, low-income families uh, who right. either get benefits in kind or benefits in cash. Uh, but it's it's a very ripe or low-hanging fruit use case because uh, there is a problem of ghost accounts, there is a problem of exclusion. Uh, right. Perhaps we can talk about social problems. Or... Yes, absolutely. The, so the, the safety net is for the bottom of the pyramid for food and secure uh, waradas, which, which are our districts. And so uh, that covers uh, about 15 to 18 million people uh, uh, taking into account households. So, um, uh, the, and all safety nets cards currently are manual and they have, uh, you know, manual IDs. So having a digital ID would ensure that uh, the beneficiary of the safety net would receive uh, uh, the right people would receive the right uh, a, the right um, support, and also uh, would help us to graduate uh, faster uh, the people because we would know uh, uh, who they are in a more transparent way. So, uh, so we would gain uh, obviously a volume in terms of enrollment speed, and on top of that, um, uh, have uh, a major uh, a major social uh, issue resolved. We've run out of time. I want to close by asking you, your day you can orchestrate, um, can you share with us the top three lessons that you've learned now that you are two years old and you can walk? So what are the top three lessons that you can tell your um, colleagues, your brothers and sisters in other countries around the world from your experience that, were, that really marked you, that really came out, st stood out in your mind, having not been in, in the ID business, but then you got into it now two years later, what would you say the top top lessons? So let me start. I'm not sure if we can stop at three because uh, it could be more uh, lessons learned. But let, okay. let me start by making one or two points. One is uh, a national ID authority is not supposed to be a one-stop shop where all the data about an individual or resident or citizen uh, is found. Uh, the more uh, fields, the more attributes you add, uh, to your national rollout, uh, if you're adding uh, marital status, if you're adding uh, level of income, occupation, you name it, whether the field is sensitive or it's a very trivial attribute, you're adding uh, you know, months and years into the completion or the achievement of your targets. So focusing on the basics, even though it seems um, counterintuitive, it's always the best way uh, to roll out uh, so focus on the foundational attributes. 
Um, I would say that's one of the biggest uh, lessons. And the other one is technology nowadays, uh, perhaps a decade ago, two decades ago, it was not available, but nowadays it's more user-centric. So user control, the citizen has to know who has access to their data, who has, who's currently uh, uh, holding their personal data, et cetera. So um, the current architecture, I mean, most of the current architecture, such as uh, the platform we use most of, allows for it and it's very important. It's a good selling point to the residents that you know, someone you don't know, some ghost uh, institution is not accessing your data. You know exactly mm -hmm. who has been accessing your data. So that kind of transparency, thanks to the technology and the architecture is possible. So it's a good uh, attribute to leverage. I open the floor to colleagues about uh, lessons learned. Yeah, just give me one one more, and then if you have even more, we take, but uh, one more at least. Uh, yeah, I wish I had more time, but I just want to say, uh, you know, the lot was discussed. Um, so at the end of the day, ID is not the product. Uh, the service is the product, and those services are received by the functional agency. So a lot of the questions that we can answer from the ID perspective, but I think the very key point that was discussed earlier was the issue of stakeholders. So what ID has been doing is really going out and identifying all the different stakeholders with their health, transportation, tax systems. And hopefully as a result of ID being the foundation, um, the citizen can get better and improve services and the, that's reflected in their day-to-day uh, -day life. So I'll go okay. back to my colleagues. If I may point? add a point, Dr. Joseph. Uh, Please. Uh, uh, a good lesson that we learned from our uh, uh, pilot stage, but also from uh, experience abroad, uh, other uh, ID implementation schemes that have advanced. Uh, one is uh, we would like to approach a, uh, the ID implementation in a use case. So we want to try the implementation the authentication and implementation of a, 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 case, a use case uh, in parallel with the registration. Mm -hmm. That would help us uh, uh, advance the acceptance of ID uh, throughout the population. The other is uh, some countries have done it alone. The government has done it alone. Other countries have adopted a completely outsourced model. Ethiopia has pos positioned in itself in between where government or NIDP will have its own role, but also uh, to realize the, the sort of objective in the timeline given. We will, of course, uh, adopt an outsourcing me mechanism as well. Thank you. So this is an excellent point. I think um, use cases are what drives uh, enrollment and um, enrollment what ma makes use cases even more powerful because this is a chicken and egg, egg problem, but you need to start in parallel. You need to believe that you cannot wait till you've got the foundational system sitting and then start thinking, oh, what use cases are we going to do this? This is why I find that many countries um, social protection, social safety nets provide a significant boost to enrollment because these are people that are really desperate to have some help and assistance and they need to be taken care of, unlike a tax pro program or driver's license or passports, where these are privileged people, they're already in a database, they already are receiving services. By focusing on the bottom um, sort of quarter of the, of the, of the population, um, you're able to achieve two things. You're able to, to, to deliver value to those who need it most, but also you're able to achieve some level of momentum because you're getting enrollments faster than if you just relied on use cases only targeting the, the well-to-do people. So unless somebody needs, needs to make one last point, um, I'd like to um, really thank you for this wonderful insights that you've shared and for being generous with the identity community and um, everybody it, it's definitely will benefit from, the, from what you had to say. Again, this is work in progress and that's why I think this was an exciting discussion because it gives us an insight about how you're doing it. I mean, essentially you're changing the the, the tires on a car while well, it's still moving at 60 miles an hour. So it's, I understand how you're, you're uh, doing this. You're not waiting to stop and arrive and, and do what you need to do. Um, there, there have been some, some questions that were, were uh, uh, some were answered in, in the course of discussion, but if there is any opportunity to answer some of them, if they were very specific and contact the, the person who uh, 
raise the questions, please do so. We encourage you to do so. Um, in the meantime, once again, thank you. And we look forward to getting more updates from you as we reconvene again through various segments uh, within the live cast and within the annual general meeting. So once again, thank you very, very much for taking the time. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Joseph. And uh, I thank the ID4 Africa team for setting up these uh, very good uh, platforms. Uh, it's thanks to ID4 Africa that we've learned and we've been uh, made aware of the major players in the ID ecosystem. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay, um, operator, you can leave, put a message at the end, but leave leave a little bit of the chat and the question and answer so that uh, if there's any opportunity to answer some of them before we terminate the, the session. Thank you all. And please, to the, uh, to the audience, uh, we look forward to seeing you in another major, major episode on the 19th of October. So please stay with us, come back in the 19th of October. There is something also very, very um, intense and information rich.